Good morning and good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending the WWO celebration of the 25th anniversary of Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. Uh, this is on behalf of World Women Organization, we extend to you our most heartfelt welcome. Uh, at the starting of the second day, we would like to invite Director General Angela to give us her remarks. Angela, please, the floor is yours. Excellency, friends and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. It's a great honor to be here and deliver some remarks at the celebration of the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. And I would like to share with you that yesterday we have a successful event on global. I would like to represent the World Women Organization in my own name, welcome all distinguished guests. While we acknowledge the great strides we have made on gender equality, and recognize that many glass ceilings have been shattered over the past quarter of a century. We celebrate the heights scaled by women in their respective fields, may it be captains of industries, leaders of nations, scientists, artists, business leaders, spokesmen, artists, or singers. These not only illustrate the progress on what was laid down in the Beijing Declaration, but also shows that given the opportunity, women can also scale the highest mountains and dive the deepest seas. Dating back to the 20th century, the World Women Organization actively participating in the fight for women's basic rights and has been engaging in women's environmental issues for over 50 years. Right now, with the COVID-19 spreading out around the world, with so many countries and people still suffering from its destruction, we need to innovate and enhance our mission, redouble our effort to protect human peace, promote women's development and make a difference. According to studies, nearly 60% of women around the world work in the informal economy, earning less, saving less, and are at greater risk of falling into poverty. The United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, launched the policy belief that illustrates how COVID-19 could reverse the progress that has been made on gender equality, gender harmony, and women's rights. He recommends ways to put women's leadership and contribution at the heart of resilience and recovery. He specifically mentioned three a priority, including assurance of women's equal representation in all COVID-19 response, planning, and decision-making. Drive for transformative change for gender harmony by addressing the care economy, both pay and unpaid, and to target women and girls in an effort to address the socio-economy impact of COVID-19. COVID-19 is not only challenging global health systems, but a task for our common humanity. We must answer the call from UN Secretary General Mr. Guterres, where governments are encouraged, are encouraged to take steps to protect women and girls' rights and expand domestic support service, achieving gender harmony and promoting sustainable development is a universal effort that needs everyone's participation, not only women, but also men. Solidarity and understanding are essential to achieving our shared goals, engaging boys and young men in understanding the good and important to gender harmony and recognizing their role in promoting the development of women and girls are an important opportunity to the realization of common sustainable development. Men's engagement greatly contributes to the overall gender harmony 
and common sustainable development, gender harmony and promotion of women's development. To realize common development are essential to getting through the pandemic. The World Women Organization is going to formulate a series of plans for the global environment and economy reconstruction for the COVID-19 recovery. Excellencies, friends and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, this is a very special year for global development and women's development. This year, we encounter unprecedented difficulties, but we see the mobilization to fight against the problems caused by the worldwide pandemic. Also, we experience anxiety, sadness, and depression. We are heartened by the people who are at the front lines, risking their lives to help those who are suffering. Gender harmony and sustainable development are critical issues that exist worldwide. The role of women and child are essential in making the recovery faster in all aspects. We need to raise awareness on the importance and indispensability of women's role in the society. We need to provide enough support to those who are making effort and making a difference. Putting women and girls at the center of the economies will fundamentally achieve better outcomes and contribute to the achievement of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. In achieving equality in rights across genders, we need to achieve gender harmony and promote human peace. We need to be reminded that we do not fall into the trap of promoting a certain gender over the other. And maintain fairness in order for women's rights movement to remain pure, positive, and constructive. We should respect the gender difference that we have and embrace the different strengths and contributions we have to offer a society. Only when both genders strive and work in harmony as one can humanity truly progress. Excellencies, friends and colleagues, today is my honor to attend this celebration. And I would like to thank the Honorable Deputy Speaker of Parliament of Malaysia for his support and thank the Cooperation of Malaysia Foreigner French Alliance. I sincerely wish the event a success. I am looking forward to listening to the voice and ideas that contribute to the development of our future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Director General. Thank you for your power and resolution to bring everyone together yesterday, today, and in the future. So our next speaker will be our Welcomes Remarks speaker, who is Ms. Jing Zhao Ciceroni. Jing, please, you have the floor. Oh, yes, yeah. Can, can you hear me well? Can everybody hear me well? Perfectly. Okay, great. Yeah, uh, today we are celebrating the landmark of the 25th anniversary of Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. It is a very crucial and groundbreaking document for the rights of women created by United Nations. The Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action was signed and adopted by 189 member states at the Fourth World Women Con uh, Conference in 1995 in Beijing. Unmatched in its scope and comprehensiveness, the landmark text symbolized a global awakening of the important role of women. So today I'm very happy to celebrate the uh, 25th anniversary here. Yesterday we have our first day of event and I want to give everyone a quick overview of um, our yesterday's event. And today will be another great day to have such a distinctive uh, list of speakers. Uh, yeah, so day one, yesterday, um, we started with the deputy speaker of the parliament of Malaysia. And he said Malaysia has made many developments in terms of gender equality, including increasing women in high level positions. And the secretary general, Angela, also mentioned about women's development is essential to economic 
uh, and de development and gender harmony, especially the gender harmony uh, notion was very well received in our global audience, as well as in our afternoon sessions, special session for China. I'll share a little more detail later. Uh, we also have Miwa Kito, who is currently the Director of Operations in the United Nations Office of Drug and uh, 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 and also had, he was uh, a, a, a headquarters. She was also the former UN Women Regional Director of Asia Pacific. She said people need to unite and work together. And she shared her experience as a UN Women uh, Director in Asia Pacific. She's based in Vietnam. And also yesterday we have Dr. Pat Minnie Murphy, uh, who is the Secretary General of Medical Women's International Association to focus on the sustainable development goals number three, good health and well-being of the UN sustainable development goals. And that is the cornerstone of women's overall development. And uh, Zhou Yiping, uh, Honorable Zhou Yiping, she, he is a special envoy of the World Women Organization and also the advisor. She, he formerly worked as a special uh, envoy for the United Nations Secretary General for the South-South Collaboration. He's also the one who hosted China's special event yesterday. And he said, on the occasion of celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration, it is necessary to affirm, reaffirm the commitment to the development of women. And John Allen, Mr. John Allen, who is the former director of the Business Council for the United Nations, he said a global council, actually he said a global council committee is need to be established to engage national leaders to make efforts in gender harmony. So next we have Dorita Biacci from Italy. And she said also uh, gender inequality is still widespread. She shared the women's current status in Italy. And also we have Christiana from uh, Benin, stayed up until four o'clock in the morning. She said sustainable development requires the participation of women. Then the next speaker, Simon Pierre Davaland, he is a president, presidential candidate for the 2016 presidential election in the Republic of Benin. He said during his speech, achieving gender harmony requires new approaches, new perspectives, and a leader's action. Uh, and uh, next we have Michael Takima from Japan. And she mentioned about the gender harmony and the sustainable development goals should be key in any area of national plans and strategies. So gender harmony is a key word yesterday, you know, mentioned by a lot of our speakers, echoed from our Director General Angela's uh, notion at the beginning of our conference. Also, we have Masato Tomabichi. He actually spoke in Chinese. He's Japanese, speak English and Chinese. He spoke in Chinese, in Chinese uh, reflected Japanese uh, delegation's participation in the World Women Conference in 1995. And he called for an increase in the proportion of women appointed by the Japanese government. Another one, uh, the next one we have, Matt Munike, Aris, he is from a Tur uh, Turkey and he's a member of the top parliament at Turkey. And he said violence against women and girls is a serious problem. We need to make efforts to improve the situation. Next, please. And we then have Claudio Shermi from Italy. He is from the president of the European Dragon Boat uh, Federation. He made contributions to women in sports, sports women's uh, uh, improvement is his uh, great, uh, you know, he contributes greatly to sports women's development. He mentioned that women's development faces many challenges and deep-rooted prejudices need to be eliminated. The next one we have Mohad Fazo um, Yusak. 
He is uh, the general secretary of the Malaysia Foreign Friendship Alliance. He and his organization has been instrumental in supporting World Women Organization and also the successful arrangement, you know, organization with this conference. And he said the development of women is also the development of mankind. And this development benefits future generations. So the, our next speaker is Farizo Nada, and he mentioned in his speak, men and women are two sides of the same coin, are both are indispensable. And our final speaker is Sunita Rahakuma, and she said it is essential to find a sustainable balance between women and men. This is a quick overview, a quick overview of our um, uh, yeah, of our speakers in the morning and which lasted actually uh, end up to be uh, four hours due to, um, you know, various uh, technical detail, uh, technical difficulties and also we encountered uh, some um, Zoom meeting bombing. That's why we learned from yesterday, today we are keeping a lot of the unidentified registrants outside of the conference room, but our entire conference will be recorded and all the recognized, you know, um, registers uh, are still in the conference. But uh, today, just make sure the smooth running of the conference, uh, we are not just letting anyone, rent, you know, people coming in for, for the conference today. So just want to, you know, make a note of that. And but the entire conference content will be shared in very large scale through different media platforms and our press releases and uh, you know the entire content and with uh, also UN and also with uh, you know the Ma Malaysia you know uh, uh, the World Women Organization so the entire content will be shared with a very large number of uh, uh, people and players uh, in the in the you know in the area yeah next page please so here, uh, you know, is uh, we yesterday in China we have two offline conferences. One is in the uh, Beijing and one is in Shanghai. Here is our Beijing conference room and it's held in Phoenix uh, TV network, and they broadcasted the entire session. And also, um, uh, you know, our our content today will be shared with them as well. And the Beijing one with people from the Beijing Women's Federation who worked. Uh, in the conference 25 years ago and uh, they shared their experience back then and shared what they have done over the last few you know 20 25 years here's our Beijing conference room and you can see a number here at this uh, picture is our online sharing it's uh, 532,000 people attended you know attended the afternoon session in China not the morning session morning session the international session we are sharing with our Chinese audience separately because they won't be able to have the access to the international session without any translation but the content will be shared next page please and uh, here's our Shanghai conference room and uh, uh, we have a pretty uh, we have a very good representations from uh, uh, you know, Shanghai UN, um, you know, uh, with our Shanghai partners. This is our Shanghai conference room, yeah. So here I would like to get back to the Beijing Declaration just to give everybody a brief overview of what we agreed upon 25 years ago. So the 1995 Beijing Platform for Actions Outcome is considered the most progressive pr pr blueprint ever for advancing women's rights because it helped establish the defining framework for change. The Platform for Action made comprehensive commitments on the 12 critical areas of concern. Even 25 years later, it remains a powerful source of guidance and inspiration. Those critical areas of concerns of Black Beijing Platform are as following, women and the environment, women in power and decision-making, the girl-child, women and the economy, women and poverty, violence against women, human rights of women, education and the training of women, institutional mechanisms for the advancement of women, women and health, women and the media, women and armed conflict. 
So for this reason, I'm delighted to introduce the work that the World Women Organization has been doing. The World Women Organization was funded on the principles set forth in the Beijing Declaration. And it is registered with the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Next page, please. So um, the vision of the World Women Organization is to advance the overall development of women worldwide in order to achieve a peaceful, a dignified and equitable future for all humankind. Our mission is for women everywhere to achieve their full potential in all areas, including, um, in, including fundamental rights, health, education and economic independence with a supportive and a sustainable community. The World Women Organization works collaboratively towards measurable impacts at both a local and a global level by connecting leaders and advocates from all over the world to promote women's overall development. So, yeah, yes, okay, yeah, vision, then the next page, yeah. Next page, please, yeah. So the future of women is the future of mankind. So to promote gender harmony, the, the principles of, uh, hold on, please, okay. Yeah, the principles of the World Women Organization are in line with the three major documents of the United Nations, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So we, what we do is focus on these five areas. Women, economic independence, education, health, and uh, sustainable development. Are we okay here? Oh. Yeah, yeah, we can go to the next page, yeah. Here you can see a visual representation of, about what we believe constitutes an overall development of a women. A women's health, fundamental rights, education, and economic independence, all within a supportive and sustainable community. All of these areas are connected and interdependent, and a prosperous future means achieving the full advancement of these areas. So to, to achieve these goals, uh, the World Women Organization has created four committees as here, Corporate Social Responsibility Committee, House Committee, Education Committee, and Economic and the Trade Committee. And thank you all for joining us this year. And uh, we are planning for the APAC Asia Pacific Women Leadership Summit uh, in November this year, when Malaysia, Malaysia, Malaysia is a hosting country for, um, uh, for the APAC conference. In the next year, we are planning on the World Women Conference on Development. So those are all the exciting things we're doing. And yesterday in China, we also announced about the World Women Academy. That's an education you know, institution we are planning to do. And also we are planning on initiatives and uh, funds for supporting women entrepreneurs uh, in different areas. That's you know, from our Beijing conference, from our Shanghai conference uh, yesterday. So I'm very happy to share everything, uh, share uh, you know, yesterday's conference and uh, also what women organization will, will do. And uh, so um, thank you. Now let's get back to Sha. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jing. That was a very comprehensive summary of a successful first day. So now I have the greatest pleasure to invite today's keynote speaker, Dr. Valora Washington. Uh, she is a very accomplished educator, uh, and she was the former CEO of the Council for Professional Recognition. Uh, today, we're really delighted that she can share her wisdom with us. So Dr. Washington, you have the floor, please. And in the meanwhile, I'll play your slides. Hold on. Would you please to unmute? Great. Hi. Mm -hmm. Hello. So I'm Delora Washington, and um, it is really my honor to join you to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the Beijing declaration and to celebrate this important role of women in global development. 25 years ago, the Beijing Declaration and Platform talked about the importance of shared power and responsibility between women and men at home, as well as in the workplace and in the wider national and international communities. 
So this is not just a matter of individual behavior. It is a matter of public policy. And this message of shared power and responsibility between women and men, especially in the care and education of children, is a fundamental guiding principle of the work I have done for several decades. Any authentic and candid conversation about gender equality has to take into account the fact that many younger generations are raised and educated, and how is that being done? Because the truth is that a major factor in gender inequality is the fact that women's work as mothers doing unpaid domestic labor and the occupational segregation of professionals like early childhood educators who take care of children have led to employment discrimination and the wrongful devaluation of the work that women do that in fact leverages human capital. For example, recently in the United States, the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic underscored the reality that early childhood educators, most of whom are women, and disproportionately women of color, are essential workers needed to revive our economy in the COVID environment. There are so many ironies about this now elevated public essentialness of this work, because these women, and especially women of color, are among the lowest paid education professionals. They work in the context of multiple structural inequities, including salary disparities, with Black women being paid the least. Exploited and invisible, even within their career field, these Black and Brown women have had their voices muted, their leadership roles denied, and opportunities lacking for their own children. That their work is now heralded as so essential underscores a core intersectional reality and that is a focus on how and by whom children are raised and educated is fundamental to women's empowerment and gender equality, as well as to children's rights and racial justice. So, the good news is that this new generation, the alpha generation of children born since 2010, gives us all new opportunities to rethink how our adult behavior with children can transform all of our societies. With examples from my own experience in the United States, today I want to introduce you to the new alpha generation and the global implications of the world into which they and we all are entering. Mark McCrindle, a keen observer of this new alpha generation, points out that there's 9,000 of these children born every day in the United States and two and a half million born every week around the world. In 2050, when the oldest of these children is 40 years old, there'll be 35 million of them in the United States and almost 2 billion worldwide. So there are six major areas about this new alpha generation that consider together set a framework for transformational intersectional change for the children as well as for women, families, and people of color. So I'm going to briefly discuss what these six characteristics are. The first is that Generation Alpha is going to live and interact with many generational cohorts, largely because of the increasing human lifespan. The global average life expectancy of humans in 1900 was just 31 years old, but to today it's 72 years old. And in the United States, if you're 65 years old, you can expect to live to age 85. So these children today are gonna benefit from exposure to many more perspectives but also the interplay of all of these generations can bring about perceived competition for economic security across generations. The second thing I want to bring out of the six qualities is that Generation Alpha is going to live in smaller, constantly evolving families that represent growing complexity and diversity. In the United States, one child families are gaining ground and the ideal family size has dropped from four kids to two, largely because it is so expensive to raise children. It's not surprising when you consider that the parents of children today, largely millennials and Generation Z, 
have come of age in an era characterized by relatively insecure career paths, a shaky job market, lower incomes relative to their levels of educational preparation, fewer economic supports, a gig economy, and widening economic inequality. All of these factors contribute to the fact that children today and the parents of children today are less likely to be married. They're more likely to have multiple partner fertility. They're more likely to be older than in the past and to have a higher education. Let's look at the third factor about this new generation of children that's gonna transform our lives and impact the role of women. And that is in all types of families, Generation Alpha's engagement with technology is unparalleled. Technology is infused into the lives of our young children today, and many parents are preparing their children for a life online, sometimes even before they're born. Millennial parents are quite comfortable connecting their children to innovative technology tools, such as health wearables or artificial intelligence diagnoses, or even robot surgeons. Tech-savvy Generation Alpha children are growing up with user-friendly conversational technology. To them, it's normal to hear the voice of Siri or Alexa or Google Assistant in their homes. Whatever the benefits and risk of this technology in children's lives, it is deeply embedded by now. The fourth factor has to do with the fact that Generation Alpha, because of technology in part, is going to be exceptionally globally connected, creating similarities across generations across the globe. The lives of Generation Alpha is very much going to be shaped by changes in global power and demographic shifts. For example, although the United States might have a smaller child population in the past, the world in general may not. Older adults are going to be concentrated in relatively wealthy countries and the young in relatively poor countries. Some countries are going to have high fertility and rapid population growth and others are going to be facing decreasing population size due to low fertility or immigration. And many observers have pointed out that this could lead to disrupted global economies, political unrest, and mass migration. But the real signature of the Generation Alpha, number five, is that diversity is going to be their signature. Diversity is the new normal and is likely irreversible. The new portrait of the United States is an aging, slow growing, declining white population that's gonna exist in tandem with rising racially diverse youth. So we can see that racial and ethnic minorities are gonna be the economic and demographic engine of all the future growth. The share of mixed race children is going to double. And children of color are the fastest growing populations, especially Hispanics and Asians, for which immigration is a major factor accounting for the substantial increases. Each new generation is more racially diverse than the one that came before it. But within this diversity, there's enormous achievement and opportunity gaps between groups. The final and sixth characteristic that I want to mention is that this new generation really has the potential to transform adulthood altogether. This can mean major changes in issues of gender and racial equality. This is going to be a generation that in the United States might be better educated, but they're going to be differently educated because people are going to more highly prize online and non-traditional certification programs at every stage of development. Continuing education is going to be a womb to tomb necessity for this generation because of automation, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and many new pathways to demonstrate competency. There are gonna be a lot of dominant questions, questions about what really does employment mean? and who's gonna be disrupted by automation, and what is the impact on all of these untrained workers? 
as career pathways become less predictable or stable by both necessity and temperament, Generation Alpha is going to have to be more entrepreneurial. They will probably be expected to change jobs more frequently. They're gonna maybe work on more freelance contracts and robots could take over certain types of production. This fast paced, flexible approach to work is revolutionary and potentially jarring to the psyche. How are alphas gonna support such a large aging population? How is persistent equity and opportunity gaps going to impact a nation as people of color become a larger than ever share of the adult population? My friends, these six characteristics of the alpha generation indicate that we are headed into uncharted waters with many, many possibilities or perils ahead. What happens next is going to depend on the choices that we make right now. And as Hillary Rodden Clinton said at the conference 25 years ago, the choices we make must have the full participation of women if we want freedom and democracy to thrive and endure. Work of, for, and about women is powerfully essential. Our destinies depend on enhancing the human potential of all people. In my view, there are three fundamental game changers that can make a difference. Intersectional game changers that could profoundly impact the lives of women. The first game changer is that we have got to have universal systems for supporting people in a way that becomes normative. That means that we offer universal paid family leave and greater visibility for unpaid work in order for businesses and family life to thrive. This is a game changer because some research that suggests that Americans would live four years longer if the United States had a more secure safety net. And there's estimates that anywhere between 600 to 1,000 infant deaths could be prevented if we had 12 weeks of family leave. The second game changer is that we have got to invest for all children everywhere in high quality, tuition free, child care, and early childhood education. This is a game changer for children, but also for women and for men. Absenteeism and lost productivity due to child care crisis cost the United States about $3 billion a year. Subsidized child care has been documented to significantly impact women's employment in industrialized nations. Child care is perhaps the biggest barrier to gender equity in the workplace. Research estimates that if the United States women between the ages of 25 and 54 participated in the labor force at the rate they do in some other countries, there would be 5 million more women in the labor force, which would translate into $500 billion of economic activity a year. In other words, friends, the economy is helped when women are employed especially since 40% of women are the sole or primary provider in their households. In families that can't find childcare, mother's likelihood of employment, but not father's is strongly impacted. Not surprisingly in the United States, those most affected are low income women of color. And the third and final game changer that I suggest is that we have got to have more equity of opportunity for all children. And this has to become a unifying objective for women's empowerment and mobilization. As key drivers of our children's futures, families have to lead efforts to close achievement and opportunity gaps because in the diverse nation and world that we already are and that we will increasingly become, we can no longer prosper if large numbers of children are left behind. Frontline proactive investments that support people, early childhood education, and equity of opportunity are going to pave the way for women's success. It's important to note that these three game changers are not political party platforms. They benefit everyone. They are not ideological positions. They're responses to demographic and social realities, and they are not for special interests. 
because they're going to promote women's development, but also the development of men and for children. Are these game changers achievable? I think most certainly that they are. And change is not optional and neither is courage. We can and we must accept the bold challenge to prepare ourselves for our future in an alpha generation context that we ourselves have never experienced. It is not going to be easy. Many people are gonna be uncomfortable with the increased diversity, the increased technology and the new family forms. But as Robin DiAngelo points out, the key to moving forward is what we do with our discomfort. The reality is that the work never stops. It cannot stop, but we can move forward if we have the courage to deal with it head on. Intersectional racism, sexism, and other social ills have a long, appalling, and painful past that have yielded contemporary consequences. But these realities that have plagued us for generations don't have to be permanent. We have hope always. We have empathy and compassion. We will need to recognize equity as the path to equality and to encourage restorative justice. This is a participatory conversation that is vital to the well being of women in our world. We must be change makers ourselves, and for a better world, we continue to be essential. Thank you very much, Shah. Thank you so very much, Dr. Washington, for your eloquent and well-researched remarks. We are all deeply touched uh, by this very sobering forecast of the future, uh, what the future will look like. I think not only it's critically important how we raise the Generation Alpha and how to coexist with Generation Alpha, but uh, all of the six characteristics you point out are also very key to how we, at this day and age, to carry on with our life and mission. Um, I think among so many, so many different highlights that you mentioned, some really strike a chord to my heart, as you mentioned that uh, the economy is helped when women are employed. As we all yes. know that all the women now online are either working mothers or um, not, not mother, but a working woman. Uh, we all have our share in the economy and we all feel a very innate obligation to move the economy ahead. Uh, and another uh, quote from your remarks is, education e e equality is a unified objective across all races, all countries, all gender. So we couldn't agree more that the opportunity for young kids, especially this generation alpha, is key to our shared human future. And last but not least, you mentioned about participatory and everyone is a change maker. I think that's really the high point of your very eloquent remark that we all can thrive for. So thank you so much for your remarks today. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Great. So we will proceed with the program for today. Uh, the next speaker is Mr. Vincent Chua. He is a special advisor to member of Royal Family of Malaysia. Uh, I would like to share a little background of Mr. Chua. Uh, he graduated from the University of Sydney with a Bachelor of Commerce degree and holds an MBA from the University of Birmingham. He was then offered by a Malaysia bank to be the high head of consumer department in 2007. Currently, Mr. Chua is assisting the Malaysia Royal Family as special advisor to plan for the charity related campaigns and affairs. Thank you so much for your time today, Mr. Chua, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. So uh, my honorable Angela, the Director General of uh, WWO and dear all excellent speakers. Um, I guess today, if I know today is a holiday of Malaysia, it's actually a Malaysia day. <laughs> I wouldn't actually uh, join this because uh, we have a, a by-election by in, in Sabah as a, it's published in the news everywhere. So as uh, I'm also very active in the politics, uh, I 
thing I will spend time there. But anyway, this is okay. It's after all, it's just a 10 minutes talk, okay? Um, on behalf of the royal family of Malaysia, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Vincent M. Mahanda, Special Advisor for Charity and Poverty Alleviation Projects. Over the course of the last six months since the COVID start, our Royal Charity Foundation has, as you might imagine, we have received many requests for assistance on behalf of the foundation. I, myself, have personally visited families in need to provide them with aids and supplies. In a world where information now breathes the planet seven times per second, perhaps even more terrifying than this pandemic are the economic effects resulting from the global rating to it. Keeping up with world economic news, most of us here have probably seen the world depression being thrown around in the last few months. And now, we are not in a history class here. We are talking about an unprecedented amount of bankruptcies and corporate insolvency worldwide. We are talking about currency exchange chaos and stock market crisis. We are talking about every country facing misery in their social economic conditions. We are talking about a sharp rise in the unemployment worldwide as a, na as a nation, we have never seen this type of phenomenon or condition since the global economic depressions of 1987. I think most of us would agree that these are already worse than the year 1997, whereby with the Asia financial crisis is happening, and we are potentially looking at a great depression level, even in the near futures. So, whatever the case may be, I would just like to remind people around the world that we need to be united now more than ever. Now, up to this point, to most of you actually listening now, first of first off, congratulations, and second, this has probably sound like a doom and gloom speech up until now. Because as I remind us all to be united, I would also like to remind us that it is only the brightest light that casts the darkness shadows. The world that await us could just as easily be based on a camaraderie among all individuals who are not divided by outwardly appearance and culturally derived answer, but instead and united and driven by creative innovation, courageous experimentations, the spirits of adventure, and an unrelenting will to innovate recognize that analysis and, uh, anything is in need is possible. So again, it is up to us, my friends. Let's work together. In closing, I would like to praise first the Malaysia Rakyat for being a bright light to the world in this time of the world darkness. And I think the number proves it. And second, the Malaysian government for their decision, action, and laying a framework for the Rakyat. And finally, on behalf of the Malaysia royal family, I would like to especially call on more women to be encouraged and participate in the national reconstruction plan after the pandemic has been devastated. Thank you all so much. And may this WWO conference to be a great success. Thank you so very much, Mr. Trot. Uh, sorry for our ignorance of this is a public holiday in Malaysia. Uh, so yeah. that special thanks for making the time. 
Um, I think, yes, as you said, it's a gloom picture of all the uh, environment and the year that we're in, 2020. It's really unconventional. But uh, echo to your blessing to the world that unity and united is more important than ever before. And that's the source of power that we can overcome. So thank you so much for your remarks. Yeah, well, thank you. Great. So we move on to our next speaker, Mr. Kaui Ten Hai. He was the first arriver uh, today at the conference room. So I thank him so much for being patient and uh, spending this entire morning with us. Uh, let me introduce Mr. Ten Hai to the audience. <coughs> he is the former Secretary of State of DAP. He's a former member of Legislative Assembly of Malaysia of Penang. He served as a DAP Penang State Secretary. Mr. Ten Hai started his political journey influenced by his father, who was also a member of the political party. After joining DAP, Mr. Ten Hai was appointed as deputy chairman of Penang DAPSY, and the following year, he was elected as chairman of Penang DAP Socialist Youth. During the DAP Socialist Youth Annual General Meeting, he laid down his ideology and roadmap of youth, citing good governance should have longevity, grassroots penetration, and a wide coverage. Mr. Ten Hai, the floor is yours. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Honorable Angela, Director General of a World Women Organization, Excellence. Excellences, uh, friends, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning. Uh, selamat pagi. First of all, I would like uh, to take this opportunity to congratulate the organizers' success to organize this remarkable event celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration and the platform of action today. I'm from Malaysia, so some of my view may, uh, and study may from the angle uh, of the situation in Malaysia, but uh, it shouldn't be a problem. I believe it works for uh, some other place also. Uh, that's why the World Women Organization are talking about connecting, the connecting the world, connecting the women and change the world. I always believe that the World Women Organization are contribute through connecting people around the world. And I believe women can achieve for empowerment through participating in the conversation on the hot topic. Uh, WWO on the commitment to gender equality, assessment, the achievement of the women empowerment. Most important is to take the initiative and uh, participate the conversation to the important sector, especially environment issue and the green economy, which are very important now and also in the future. In the year of uh, 2020, we're facing a lot of a challenge. It looks like a turning point for, the, for our human beings in this century. The hot topic now is a COVID-19 pandemic and also the unstoppable environment issue. It gives a significant warning to a human development. We must not uh, only focus in the economics development, but the green economics development. We need a balance so women play a very important role. To take part in a sustainable development and balance up the world, when we talk about sustainable, we should touch in the green. With a rapidly growing, expanding our networking and the building bridge with all the stakeholders ranging from the NGOs, governments, departments, communities, schools, private sectors and the individuals to address and resolve the environment challenge in all over the world. We have a responsibility to act towards modern environment protection movement including to protect our species involved in the green technology, green economics, responsibility to preserve our planet. Today, we face a threat that also uh, requires a collective action. Let's, in thinking on putting the content of the environmental issue and the concerns critical and constructive to make sure sustainable development for the future for women development. Human activities, is uh, disrupting the climate and the challenge of the combating climate change is one of will define the contour of our time. The effects of the climate change are already evidenced in the strong storm, deep draft, irregular downpour, which cause a massive flood rapid, uh, rapidly 
eroding soil. And as these few years, everywhere in the world are facing hot weather, which the temperature has a rise up to 40 degrees Celsius. And it also affected a lot of the economic losses. Estimate is uh, about 15% uh, in the economic loss in our world economy. So no man, in, in, no man is in an island. We each have a role to play in the ensure that we do not pass a world beyond repair onto our children. Everyone must do their part. And as long as we united to protect the one planet we have, we can leave it in a better shape for future generations. Together, we can create a powerful movement to help deliver strong global commitments to tackle this threat and save mankind. I would like to take this uh, opportunity to express my deepest uh, gratitude to the senior of the World Women Organization for being putting the effort in the past, especially the movement for the Beijing Declaration and the Platform and Action was signed and adopted by 189 member states at the fourth World Conference on 1975. Uh, 19, yeah, 75. So uh, today uh, we are celebrating 25 years anniversary to recognize and continue, continuous efforts need to be made to preserve previous success and achieve a future development goals. This platform will encourage more attention and communication, conversation throughout the different group of people, different uh, uh, from the corner of the world and to different, to share the knowledge, to share the idea, to work together, to connecting around the world towards the objective of equality peaceful and a sustainable society. We can see a difference uh, gender, race, age, and speaking in the different language here. And however, when it comes to the sustainability issue, especially the environment protection, we believe that regardless of a difference in the language and culture values, we are always on the same pace. I use the words participating in the conversation in conjunction with the connecting women changing the world. I urge a woman to take an initiative to participate in conversation in a hot topic, especially the environment issue, to contribute to resolve the problems together. Then the equality and the empowerment will be in the present. Last but not least, uh, thank you very much for inviting me here and uh, thank you for the team organizer for the effort to making this event success. Today is a really very special day, not only to celebrating 25th anniversary, and also uh, to celebrating our Malaysian National Day. So allow me to wish you all the best in the Malay language. Selamat Hari Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Khoi Teng Hai. Uh, this is really a very special day for all of the participants. And thank you for your very resounding word, that uh, participatory conversation. And thank you so much for echoing our motto, uh, connecting women, changing the world. Thank you so much for your time today. We will proceed to the next speaker, uh, who is also a very well accomplished woman. Her name is Priscilla Liu. Uh, let me introduce Dr. Priscilla Liu before she can show her screen. Uh, Dr. Liu joined Deutsche Bank in January 2014 uh, as Managing Director of Sustainable Development, Alternatives for Deutsche Bank Asset Management. Formerly entity name was DSDWS in Asia. She has a private equity and asset management investment for clean energy and environment industries in China and is on the Green Finance Committee organized by the People's Bank of China. And also, she's a member of the International Partner Committee of AMAC, the regulatory organization for asset management in China. Formerly, Dr. Liu was the founder and managing partner of Cathy Capital, a cross-border fund investing in healthcare and clean tech in China. Without further ado, Dr. Liu, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I am very honored to be part of this uh, very important event, World Women Organization, and celebrating the 25th anniversary. And uh, to have the opportunity to address all of the honorary guests and honorary speakers. 2020 is indeed a year to remember. It will really, hopefully, transform the values in terms of how we look at the world and prioritize what's important. 
we are awakening to the true needs of the society and hopefully we'll have the opportunity for women to make a difference in changing it. So the women's movement, which started more than several decades ago, has made modest progress. The strive for equality continues. And um, as of 2019, only 24% of sovereign nations had more than 30% in parliament. The major English speaking democracies are, um, are ranking more on the top of the countries that were evaluated, which were 189 countries with New Zealand ranking 16 and women representing in New Zealand over 40% and uh, United Kingdom ranking at 39. Um, US, however, ranks at 78 and uh, even Canada is uh, ranked uh, uh, only at 60. But um, surprisingly, uh, and, and, and of course very impressively, Rwanda is uh, ranked top at 61% in terms of representation of women in parliament and government. And so um, what we're seeing is that many of the Asian countries, uh, including of course India, Japan, Korea, uh, there seems to be a lag in terms of women representation in government. So much has to be done to change that. China, unfortunately at the government level, is still lagging behind. Of the 2004 people on the party's central committee, only 10 of them are women. And uh, this has, been, has not changed since the 18th Congress in 2012. Women now uh, make up 24% of the 2,287 delegates, uh, according to People's Daily, that's a great progress. And so uh, we shall continue to push forward for women to take more um, positions in government to help change the uh, reg regulations and policies for equality. We are seeing, of course, many uh, significant entrepreneurs, as Anla Zhang, the previous speaker, has indicated, where uh, Chinese, uh, in China, women are taking more significant roles in being entrepreneur and running businesses. So that's a very positive indication. So nonetheless, the world has made some strides in terms of women leaders in government. Notably, Angela Merkel in Germany, Jacinda Ardern of New Zealand, a president of Singapore, uh, Halima Jacob, and president of Bangladesh, Sheikh Hasina, including, of course, Prime Minister of Denmark, Norway, and Finland are all women, uh, Matt Friedersen, Erna Solberg, and Sana Marin, Marin, as well as the president of Switzerland, uh, Simonetta Somorocco, is also a woman. And also the president of Greece is also a woman, Katerina Sakharopoulou. So these are very positive strides and progress because with the women in government, we are finding that women are more sensitive to the needs of the society driven by the goals that are set to really improve the life, well-being and the, and the lives of, of the community. So having women in government leadership roles does matter and we, we can see that very clearly. Um, women traditionally, historically, has played the role of serving rather than be served. Society roles of women have largely been to look for greater good for the family, for the community, and the society, with priorities placed on looking at the broader goals that benefit the community. Women tend not to be the egocentric dictators that focuses on self-serving agendas. What we experience is that most women in leadership positions usually have had a challenging journey to prove themselves, to be better and also to be more qualified and more capable to earn the recognition for their leadership roles. There is less likely the sense of entitlement and generally the earned responsibilities are backed by more than adequate qualifications as well as experience and not by the persona or charisma that, that is uh, of the personality. So women who are women are more driven by the goals to attain results, to improve the community's health, the education availability to, to, to all, all classes of, 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 uh, in the society, and also the welfare. And they are more likely to collaborate across party lines and to advocate for policies and legislations that changes the world. They're not as entrenched with what has already been established. On the business side, there has been much success. 
many, many women entrepreneurs have made uh, to the CEO and the boardrooms. The statistics in 2019, however, for Fortune 500 for the more established organizations, uh, we've been able to achieve 33 females being appointed as CEOs. This is only 6.6% of the group. This, of course, is already an improvement from the 4.8% in 2018. However, there's still not enough. Uh, that's a very small single percentage of the CEOs in the for Fortune 500. In 2019, the proportion of women in senior management roles globally um, uh, and, and in the US also grew. And so the number has been growing, so, uh, but slowly. And part of this is that ingrained in the traditional society values, uh, women, what we're seeing is that they take a different kind of functional roles in the corporations. Women are overrepresented in support functions like administration um, and, uh, and also HR, while men tend to concentrate on operations, profit and loss, uh, more decision making and research and development. So unfortunately, supporting roles in corporations generally is more difficult and challenging to get to the top. More than 40% of the human resources, according to um, statistics, in the 2020 uh, for human resource are women and compared to 17 percent uh, of those that are in um, marketing officers and 16 percent in chief information officers so we can see that there is a disparity in terms of the kind of responsibility and roles because of this the career track it makes it difficult for women to get to the top to get to the C-suite, as we call it, which is CEO, CFO, CTO, COO positions. And the imprint of supporting roles as the key attributes tagged to women in executive management tend to put women uh, in a, a, role, a position where they follow. So these are for large corporations. Fortunately, we do have women who uh, establish themselves in an entrepreneurial role and become CEOs and chairmen. So we look forward to these women really creating the large companies and becoming uh, a significant part of the businesses in the world in the future. So, um, so what we're seeing that because of this, we're seeing that it's difficult for women to get to the executive boardroom and that we should do more to help support women to move in those positions. We believe that in this very challenging world in 2020, there are significant opportunities for women to, to really break out or break away, if you will, from what is already entrenched as the tradition and really establish themselves, their leadership in changing what is really creating a lot of the issues and problems with society, both from the government level as well as at the business level. And of course, women of color is, is even um, more, less represented in, 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 in executive management, including of course, Asians, Blacks, Hispanics. And so again, these are in single digit percentages uh, uh, globally. And so why is 2020 a transformative year? The worldwide pandemic has brought into focus and accentuated the disparity in our society, whether that be in healthcare, whether that be in living conditions, as well as availability of government support for the needy. This disparity is calling for change. Changes that only the non-entrenched, the women of the world, is able to see and drive with a level of fervor that is aimed at creating positive outcomes. Women in the various roles now have the opportunity to make a difference, whether it's business or in government, to change and because women are untethered to the historical norms. We should stand up, stand out, speak out, and act on behalf of the silent majority who cannot and will not tolerate perpetuating complacency. What matters now more than ever is the well-being and the welfare of the people. Women has the opportunity to make a difference to effect, effect changes by taking innovative, non-traditional methods for addressing the problems at hand with the goals of implementing transformative policies in government or lead new businesses 
that focuses on improving and making a better world through sustainable cir circular economy and improving the healthcare, education, and equality for all. So um, we, I see this as really a, a transformative year for women to really make a difference and look at the opportunities to make a change and break out from the norm and break out from the crowd, if you will, and uh, stand up and speak up and speak up and, and uh, make a difference. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Dr. Liu. Stand up and speak up. Thank you. I think those words we will all carry to heart. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Wally Idris Ajibad. Uh, Dr. Wally uh, is the founder and executive director of African Views Organization. It's a nonprofit in consultative status with the United Nations Economic and Social Council. The organization focuses on the well being of society by promoting culture sustainability and culture harmony through social research, community assessment, resource mapping, and project development. Dr. Ajibad is the progenitor of the Royal Institute of Global African Cultures and Traditions, as well as the Royal African Kingdom's pursuit of the UN observer status. I think today he came with some very good uh, news to all of us. So Dr. Uh, Ajibad, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so very much. It's such a delight to be here today. Um, I'm very happy to see familiar faces like Dr. Uh, like uh, uh, Miss Priscilla, Priscilla, who just spoke. Uh, I don't know if you remember, uh, we met in New York, um, I believe uh, last year, uh, at the great uh, um, GCRS uh, program. Uh, and so many other faces that I've spoken earlier. Um, I want to begin by um, thanking uh, my friends uh, who have invited me to speak here today. It's such a great honor whenever you are invited as a he for she uh, to support uh, the growth of women and the advancement of women. Uh, most of you know that, who know me, know that that's quite very dear uh, to my heart and uh, it's the work that we're on. So this is why I want to commend the work of the Honorable Angela RM, uh, the Director General of the World Women's Organization, uh, also the International Relations Special Officer of the Parliament of Malaysia, uh, as, as uh, Deputy Speaker's Office, uh, and the Malaysia Foreign Friendship uh, Alliance. Uh, she has been stout uh, in, this, in this work and stoic as well. I have seen her work uh, in collaboration with the um, great uh, Jean Chow um, Cicerone, really uh, good to see you mighty women at work as well as Sha doing a great job in putting all of this program in motion. Um, I think first, uh, even before we get to the platform, I want to commend the role of uh, World Women's Association, uh, World Women's Organization in really driving the agenda with the government of Malaysia. And it's important to acknowledge the, uh, the growth of, of women advancement there, as well as the, uh, the support that they have been receiving from the Malaysian government concerning the right uh, to advance, uh, to make decisions, to health, education, uh, uh, social welfare, and uh, uh, removal of legal obstacles, and so on and so forth. Uh, the Malaysian government has really been exemplary, uh, not only as an Islamic nation, but also as a uh, 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 as a Asia East Asia region. Uh, and you could see in the uh, World Economic Forum Global Index for Gender uh, uh, Index report the advancement that they have made. Uh, today, they have over, uh, 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 they, they, they rank in East Asia alone uh, 13th, uh, which is um, compared to China, slightly better because China uh, ranks 14th. Uh, they rank 
be they rank above Korea, uh, they rank above Japan, and that's a whole lot to say uh, for a nation like that. So I think it's important to, to mention this advancement. Now, if we take a step back and we look at the growth of women in the past uh, two and a half decades, uh, that marks the advent of the, uh, of the platform for action. And we have to ask ourselves, I think it begs the question as to why that particular conference changed the world of women. Because it, it, it is without a doubt that that is actually what happened. So we, we begin to look at why that actually happened. I mean, what, what was the difference? Because there had been so many um, uh, women convention before then. Uh, you know, we, we had the Vienna Convention. Uh, we, we, we've had, uh, uh, you know, 40 years of uh, uh, CSW, which is the Commission on the Status of Women. So while those programs prior to that uh, made some advancement, none was so significant as uh, the Beijing Platform for Action Conference in 1995 in China, um, in Beijing, so in China. So uh, I think that often when we look at this, especially in today's celebration, it's important to acknowledge few facts and give what is due to Caesar. So the Beijing Platform for Conference was, of course, uh, the first international event to take place in China. And China saw this as a great opportunity to repair, as well as to improve its diplomatic relations by demonstrating that the event was not only going to be great significance for China, but in itself uh, recognizes the commitment and influence of the effort of advancements of mankind. And I want us to really put that in perspective. I want us to really put that in perspective, uh, regardless of where we are politically, socially, or, 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 or in street to polity, you know? Or, so just a, a, a obvious fact. Uh, we'll see, obviously, that uh, uh, the, the event really set up a, was set up for success right from the get-go. Uh, it helped so many people around the world to find opportunity to visit China for the first time. And masses of Chinese people get to receive a mass of foreigners from all over the world in one bulk. Uh, so that, I mean, the excitement was there and it was all building up. Just imagine of that. This was one of the largest legally organized meetings the Human Rights Conference ever held uh, uh, anywhere. So just two years prior to the Beijing conference, the World Conference on Human Rights was held in the United Nations in Vienna, Austria, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, uh, that was on my birthday on June 25th, 1993. Uh, the, 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 the World Conference on the Human Rights uh, in Vienna was the first of its kind. And then there was uh, the World Conference of Women that took place in Mexico City in 1975, uh, which had about 6,000 attendees. And the second World Women Conference took place in Copenhagen, Denmark in 1980 uh, with about 8,000 uh, people. There's some group there. Uh, the Third World Conference on Women took place in Nairobi, uh, Kenya, Kenya uh, and uh, that was in 1985. And about 15,000 people uh, in Kenya then. Now the Fourth World Conference of Women that took place uh, with unprecedented participation, over 30,000 people uh, visited activists. Now, this is hardened activists who had been working years upon years, uh, took the opportunity to visit Beijing uh, for the Fourth World Conference on Human Rights in September 1995. It's important uh, what we're building up here because the conference not only was epic that it that was due to, to work for the masses, uh, uh, but the fact that the, the declaration was generated uh, by, by the work of so many people coming together at that particular event, different people, many who have never even met before, organizations that never heard of each other before, uh, coming together to work together uh, and create these uh, declarations uh, uh, as uh, critical areas of concern. As you may know, whenever you have all these women conferences, um, many of the reports uh, would go 
uh, will be submitted to the United Nations. To the, to the, now we have the UN Women, but then we didn't. So it would, it would, you know, people would submit it, and then there will be reviews, and then we'll we'll have a summation. And this was of unprecedented magnitude at this particular time. Um, so therefore, the the uh, the platform for action remains a critical compass for gender parity which we have all unanimously agreed that it is what qualifies for gender harmony and a world that we all want, regardless of gender, class, creed, status, nationality, or race. So uh, the, the conference are really, uh, if we begin to, to look at it now, there are some other potential that we cannot uh, forget to mention in this particular forum. Uh, the, the unprecedented degree of participation by government delegates uh, and the international human rights community. We, we had people like Gertrude Mangela of Tanzania, uh, who was the Secretary General of the conference. We have um, Aung San Suu Kyi, many of you know who she is, who delivered the keynote address at the conference. And of course, we have uh, the, the great Madam Hillary Clinton uh, at the first, uh, uh, you know, who then was the first lady of the United States, uh, gave a speech on human rights, and that that, that that was a fantastic speech uh, that she gave. Everybody uh, today would agree that that's one of the things that set precedence uh, for the momentum that was built uh, that that was built for women's advancement uh, from that time. Uh, we we had, you know, as if that wasn't enough. Uh, now we we also had. Uh, um, the Nobel laureate Saint Teresa of Calcutta, that's, uh, you know, Mother Teresa, as we know her. Uh, we, we have uh, Beverly Palesa. Uh, uh, Palesa was the first African lesbian to uh, make statement arguing for LGBT in Africa. You have to understand, I mean, you know, LGBT is another topic that uh, I know is not quite welcome in Muslim uh, and Islamic uh, communities, which is uh, well understood and well supported. But at that time in China, this really gave the momentum uh, to that um, uh, 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 bravery. So that should certainly be acknowledged. Uh, we, we, we have uh, uh, great people like uh, uh, um, the Prime Minister of Iceland, which uh, is Fimbogod uh, Dattara, uh, 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 we, we had uh, uh, the Republic of, uh, the Prime Minister of the Republic of Bangladesh, uh, Begum uh, Kaleda Zia, uh, 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 Prime Minister then of uh, Pakistan, uh, uh, Beniza Bhutto, uh, Princess Basma bin Talat was there from the Republic of uh, uh, Jordan. So, I mean, I've mentioned a few um, names just to give you the, the magnitude of what came together at that event. Uh, these women, so the opportunity was there and people rose to the occasion. And I don't want us to, for one minute, uh, forget the role that China played in this. You know, the Chinese people role in the outcome of this conference has been profound. Uh, the Beijing, uh, has offered and ushered enormous improvement in women's life and unleashed remarkable political will uh, and, and worldwide visibility. Uh, since then, government, civil society, and public have translated the platform for action to promises, uh, uh, into pro into, uh, from promises into concrete changes in individual countries. Uh, many asked what role did China play today, but uh, uh, it's important that uh, we, we see how well that tone was set. And so when Priscilla was speaking, I was so proud to hear her talk about uh, how many women, uh, self-made uh, billionaires today in, 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 uh, in China. And I, I can argue that no one is surprised by that. You know, um, it, it's been a long uh, time coming, but the point here that we're making is really, um, it's not whether uh, one country does better than the other uh, or who performs better, it's the fact that we are moving this ahead. This agenda is a unanimous agenda. As we are moving forward in Asia, so we are moving forward in Africa. And I tell you, um, 
to some surprise, as Malaysia is doing so well in, in, uh, in, in Asia, we have a Muslim country that's performing the best in Africa, and that's Senegal, having uh, 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 a, a ranking that is uh, unprecedented. Uh, half of its uh, parliament is uh, women, those type of things. And, you know, we, we are making progress. And I want to, you know, if we begin to really talk about the progress that we're making, it's, it's especially in the role of women, uh, much of the areas that you know, concrete areas that needs to be addressed, uh, uh, much of which, of course, still need to uh, uh, make a lot of progress, all of us. This is why uh, this type of uh, event is so important not only to uh, show our muscles as to you know, look at our, uh, 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 what we have conquered, but the fact that let us look at it from what more needs to be done and how well we can come together to do that. And I tell you this because uh, 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 as an example of what has been going on, we understood right from the get-go that the goal of women advancement is very important and that gender harmony is the right vehicle to it. And the reason is that we completely believe that once abuses and, and uh, uh, violence against women has been removed, you know, women can do it all by themselves. They can, they can achieve greatness by themselves without anything else. The only problem is all this systemic uh, uh, abuses that has been put in place by traditions uh, and by uh, 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 cultural factors, uh, or social factors, et cetera, or whether it's in the, in, in, in the corporate arena or whether it's in a, a governmental environment, whatever the case may be, uh, or, or even any form of social context. So we know that all of these challenges that exist uh, needs to be removed. And some of them are very difficult to discuss, which again is why we are using, uh, we are talking in terms of gender harmony. You know, one of the greatest challenges we have that needed to be talked about is genital mutilations. Now, what we have done is since we recognize the, 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 the challenge, the high, just imagine the magnitude of that challenge, uh, to, to do that in developing societies, especially in Africa and, and other countries, uh, you know, clearly uh, uh, many Islamic countries, including Malaysia as well. Uh, but non nonetheless, uh, significantly in Africa, we were able to uh, convince uh, the, the, the UN women that this topic is better served by spiritual leaders and traditional rulers which is why I was very happy to hear the Prince talk so keenly about what he uh, is doing in Malaysia. And I would like for World Women Organization to uh, help us bring, you know, that we together bring this agenda along with the Prince. I think the Prince will be incredibly instrumental for this type of project, including uh, our traditional rulers, because what we have managed to do is to get traditional rulers involved in genital mutilation, uh, female genital mutilation, and, uh, and early child marriage. As you know, uh, this is one of the most detrimental factors to the growth of women in the world. And we, we can't fight this out because it, it's built into spiritual beliefs. And one of the reasons that uh, Nigeria as, well, as, as being one of the powerful economic in Africa, economic nation in Africa was um, struggling to make its constitution gender sensitive, you see. So over the years, we have been struggling to convince the nation how important it is to address specific issues that are only directed to women, that only women face. And this is why we came up with the Anti-Violence Against Women Act. Uh, this act is really an important part of the gender harmony. And again, so many um, things, so, so, so many, uh, 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 not only from the academic perspective or social, uh, but also cultural, uh, remains to be um, placed and discoursed with uh, relevant parties to see how best we can uh, Significantly, significantly mitigate or suddenly eradicate 
uh, uh, all these type of uh, cultural challenges. Uh, and I think that again, uh, 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 gender harmony is the best vehicle towards it. Um, I thank you so much uh, for for this opportunity. Uh, and as mentioned again, uh, you know, we have been able to just to mention recent success. We have been able to convince the Nigerian government to review the um, its constitution uh, in making. Uh, uh, is constitution a little bit more gender sensitive and address issues specific to women. I think those are the things that we can do in, in many uh, countries. Obviously, uh, people argue about CEDAW, knowing uh, you know, uh, the CEDAW seems very rigid. And we also believe that no one uh, cookie cutter for all. Of course, that's why this, this is why we're looking through the lenses of culture, because uh, what, not one size don't fit all in this case. We have to review uh, each uh, uh, region, uh, each uh, culture, on, on so many terms, uh, there are indices within the, uh, 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 the cultural overview and make sure that uh, everybody has a win-win situation. I thank you so much for this opportunity to speak with you and uh, share uh, the view of what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ajibad, for your very eloquent speech. Um, yes, the road is very long for us to keep working, and that's why we all convene here to celebrate what has been accomplished in the first 25, and we also look forward to what we can do together in the next 25. So let's shall move on to our next speaker, who is connecting from uh, New York. Anla, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Great. Hello. How are you? Hi. Good evening, Ella. We are wonderful. Thank Good you for morning. joining. Good morning. Are you also in New York or are you in China? I'm in Washington, D.C. Oh, I see. Very well. Well, thank you so, for having me. Oh, it's Delighted our great be. pleasure. So let me introduce you to the audience. Ms. Okay. Anna Cheng is the founder and CEO of SubChina Inc. Ms. Cheng is the uh, is the SubChina is a digital news platform about China, which aim to inform and educate the English speaking audience. Prior to SubChina, Ms. Cheng was a senior partner at SinoCentry, a China facing private equity firm, which pursues an inbound outbound China strategy. Even earlier, Ms. Chen started at Goldman Sachs on the GNMA bond desk, then to Citigroup as a Pacific base, base as an in Asia portfolio manager. Her career also then took her to Robert Fleming, where she was a senior VP and head of Asia Institu Institutional Group. Ms. Anla went on to run her own family office of hedge fund, private equity, and alternative strategy fund of funds called Centennium Capital Partners. Uh, Ms. Cesaroni and I had the greatest pleasure to attend SubChina's own Women's Summit just a few days ago. So we're so delighted that Ms. Anla recuperated and rebounded from a very painstaking effort to bring a lot of speakers, just as we do right now, uh, a few days and a good relations to a success. Thank you so much, Shah, for this very warm welcome and congratulations for this wonderful uh, conference as well. So I was asked to talk uh, about our conference and give a little summary and what the takeaways are. And I'm delighted and honored to be able to do that tonight. So we just held our fourth annual women's conference, uh, continuing our tradition of empowering and inspiring women and also celebrating their extraordinary achievements by not only uh, bringing together 450 people, mostly women, and also having uh, pivoted during COVID to host 21 cocktail rooms, each with 15 attendees. We honored two honorees and we also awarded uh, two uh, next generation of rising stars. So on September 9th morning, uh, because of COVID, we could not do it in one day. So we split it in two days, each of three hours each. 
And uh, we kicked off the conference by having two keynote speakers, one on the first day by Jane Sun, CEO of, of Trip.com, formerly C-Trip, as you may know. And she had acquired uh, TripAdvisors.com in the United States earlier this year. The next day, our kickoff uh, CEO was Stella Lee, uh, CEO of BYD, as you may know. And I'll come back to that in a second. After their wonderful keynote, uh, Jane basically said that uh, uh, through uh, traveling 10,000 miles, uh, you can really bring peace to the world by bringing, bringing US and China together. So of course she encouraged tourism. The first panel was the technology and VC panel. Uh, many of them were quite robust, award-winning women VCs, uh, one from uh, Singapore called Virgie Tang, another from Hong Kong, uh, Ruth, uh, Ruby Liu, uh, and it was Maud and Lu Zhang who won the Forbes 30 Under 30, and it was moderated by Catherine Zhu, who is the managing director at Egon Zender, who lived in China and Hong Kong for about 18 years. And, uh, and Ruth Jin, she is the founder and CEO of um, Jin and uh, 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 Cottle, which is a, a law firm. And she's also the head, uh, the chair of Beida Alumni in New York, in the United States. And uh, what I'd like to do at these conferences is to quote some uh, statistics that are really worthwhile sharing, because it goes to show that uh, women just simply do it better. So for instance, in the United States, VCs get only 2.2% of the overall funding of $85 billion. Uh, women make up about 17% of all VCs. However, the Kaufman Group research shows that actually uh, women are more capital efficient and provide higher return on investments by 35% then VCs that are run by men, and revenues that are 12% higher than startups run by men. And finally, first round capitals portfolio outperformed by companies founded by men by 63%. So uh, we like to quote that kind of statistics throughout the uh, conference. And our next um, uh, panel is all about the booming industry in China of wealth management. And in the United States and worldwide, we are witnessing what's called the Great Wealth Transfer. And the panel focused on how women may emerge as the biggest beneficiaries uh, of this wealth transfer, which is uh, forecasted to be about $68 trillion. More than 10,000 baby boomers are turning 65 every day. And over the next 20 to 30 years, uh, approximately 30 to $68 trillion of wealth is about to change hands. More women are also accumulating their own wealth. And with women expected to control two thirds of private wealth by 2020, that's this year. And women are expected on average to live seven years longer than the average man in the United States. However, only 22% of women have a comprehensive wealth transfer plan of their own in place. So that means a lot of work for uh, wealth advisors coming up. This panel was followed by a fireside chat with Amy Chua and Pauline Brown. Pauline Brown is the ex-CEO of LVMH, and they are the number one most popular brand in China. And LVMH, as you know, is a luxury brand, but in China has been the largest consumer of luxury brands. And even in COVID, they're coming back as being the largest uh, buyer. Amy Chua uh, is a, a professor at Yale, a professor of law, but she's best known, she's written seven books, quite a few of them are best-selling, but the best, the, what, what she's most well known for is her Tiger Mom book. And when the two of them had a fireside chat, one has to wonder what do they, what do the two have in common? But in fact, we talked about the fact that they're women, they're mothers, they have daughters as children. And they talked about how getting where they are uh, to a celebrity status was not easy. That they talked about grit and hard work, going out of your comfort zone and seizing opportunities and being resilient whenever possible was crucial. In, in their success. So uh, 
at the end of the day, uh, that that uh, we had uh, Susan Shirk, who was the chair of uh, the 21st century uh, of uh, UC uh, University of California, speak about politics. And this is, of course, a very sensitive issue. So I'm not going to go into it now. But uh, uh, the whole idea is what can we do to better the relationship between the US and China? The next day, we kicked off uh, with uh, Stella Lee of BYD, who gave a rousing speech on how she, even though based in California, also uh, wished to bring US and China together through her company, which she considers a green company. They're still number one in batteries for all our cell phones and PCs. And they were number one in electric vehicles, but taken over by Tesla. An amazing lady and a great role model for us all. The next panel was uh, the environment panel and the panelists were represented from the Nature Conservancy, Paulson Institute, Governor Jerry Brown's California China Climate Institute, and the NFSA, which basically used to be focused on food safety, but now has pivoted to include environment. And we think, and particularly myself as well, think that environment is one area where U.S. and China can be brought together. And so there was much discussion to see how we can do that. Uh, following that, we started the gala and we had uh, many judges uh, such as Wei-Sun Christensen, uh, which is, who is the CEO of Morgan Stanley, China, uh, Merit Jano, Dean of SIPA at Columbia University, and Alondra Nelson, President of Social Science Research. And one more uh, judge, Amy Zhang, Executive Vice President of Alger Fund, uh, had uh, reviewed about 35 nominees of the Next Gen Rising Star. Uh, and the winners included for the nonprofit area, Emma Yang, who designed apps since the age of six. And now at 16, she's designed seven apps, but the most recent app that uh, awarded her or she spoke on at TED, TED uh, Talks was a, a, an app called Timeless, which is for her grandma to uh, help Alzheimer patients. In the for-profit sector, our winner is Virginia Tan, the CEO of Teja Ventures. And she started uh, two groups called Lean in China, taken after Sheryl Sandberg's Lean in, Lean in, the book. And She Loves Tech, which is a, a women's group with over 100,000 members to empower them and, and runs an accelerator program where uh, women who have VCs or startups can pitch their own uh, VC. So she was awarded. Uh, following that, we honored two world-class businesswomen who have reshaped the US-China business community, uh, including Yan Lang, uh, Oprah Winfrey, and uh, Janet Yang of Sun Media. Um, Janet Yang, I'm sorry, Globe uh, Emma, Emmy Award-winning Hollywood producer, Joy Luck Club. And she is the first woman and the first Asian per, uh, person who was a governor at large at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Science. I don't think I timed this right, Shah. I thought that uh, I this whole speech would, would fit in 10 minutes, but can I go on for another minute or two? Or Absolutely, I... absolutely. Okay. We're, we're completely uh, encaptured by your very rich content. Oh, all right, so wonderful. Please... Yes, thank you. Um, uh, and so I'd like to throw some st more statistics. So there's a Peterson Institute called Pete Peterson started this institute of research with 21,000 companies globally finds that women in corporate leadership can significantly increase profitability. And they studied this within 91 countries and found that with uh, more women in senior positions, uh, they actually increase uh, their returns by 15% for a typical firm. So that was a very strong statistic that I'd like to I like to share with you. In addition, both EY, formerly called Ernst and Young, and Catalyst.org, which is a, a very reputable women's group that does research, continue to show that if you have more than two women board members with corporations, and they've studied over fifty thousand corporations worldwide, these companies have better return on investments, return on equity, and return on assets. And so uh, I just want to uh, go on to now uh, quickly share with you uh, the Hurun report, which as you know, very well known in China, they released their 2020 
uh, whose richest sale, self-made women in China and the world. Uh, they found that 100 self-made female billionaires from 16 countries this year, an increase of 11 women billionaires from last year. And China has 61% of the world's self-made female billionaire with a total of 61 women. The USA ranked second with 19. So China continues to rank as the highest, uh, having the highest number of women self-made billionaires. China dominates yet again uh, with nine of the top 10 and 61% of the list, well above its 20% of the world's population. 33% of the female entrepreneurs on the list are engaged in emerging industries of which advanced manufacturing and healthcare ranked first, followed by media and entertainment, big data, and e-commerce. Despite these great numbers, women only represent 16% of the total Hulu Global Rich List. And um, what I said in that the conference, and if I may say so again, uh, it just made me realize within the United States, where we haven't be beaten COVID yet, that I was pretty sure and certain that if we women had uh, ruled the United States, we would have con contained COVID-19 many months ago. And all we needed to look at are these countries that have beaten COVID, whether it's Germany, Taiwan, New Zealand, Scandinavian countries, many of which most of the all those are run by women. Of course, China and Singapore uh, have also done extremely well. So at this point, I want to close my speech, but I want to introduce SubChina, if I may take a quick moment. We are an independent news and business entity providing information and solutions to all things on China. We reach three to five million unique readers and users, having two newsletters, all forms of social media, 30 events a year, and the largest number of podcasts under one roof, all on China. We also have SubChina Direct, our business expert networks and business consultancy, and Serica Initiative, our nonprofit sister company. So I am delighted to have be able to share some of the findings that we found this year and to share this uh, great conference that empowered and inspired a lot of women. And uh, what really made us a success this year is not only having wonderful speakers, panels and awardees and honorees, but also the cocktail format, which just showed us that many people have been so stuck at home in the United States for so long that to be able to have a virtual cocktail party where something very nice and take it out of your closet that's been sitting there for like six months was a great joy for all of us and to be able to toast each other and cheer each other on. So I also would like to say cheers to all the women who are viewing this and we hope that with these research uh, data that prove that women can do it and uh, we cheer you all on. So thank you very much Shah for having me today. Thank you so much, Ella, for your time um, and uh, a very detailed recaption of the most recent uh, successful event. I think all the numbers are really uh, quite uh, astonishing to most of us. Um, but just as you are describing all of the uh, star speakers of your event, we realize that women all can rise at the very top position, either in corporate or in government. Um, so just as reflecting your event, we hear that at the World Women Organization are also assembly of women leaders from all walks of life. And that that's why we're here today celebrating this uh, special day for the 25th anniversary. And thank you for making your input. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker is from UK, Ms. Dashita Gillis. She is the founder and CEO of Mesh. Mesh is a UN award-winning global impact platform connecting high-impact organizations around the world with philanthropical capital providers and linking global progress on the SDGs. Her experience builds on the blend three facet, which are finance, technology, and planetary sustainability. Her aim is to leverage the power of emerging technologies to address the complex business and social challenges we face in a more sustainable, conscious, and strategic way. With a professional background as a chartered accountant, investment banker, executive coach, impact investing and fintech blockchain specialist, Ms. Gillis also serves on the board of 
for-profit and non-profit organizations. If you can bear with me for a second, I am now playing her video. Hello, welcome to this short conversation with me um, on women and entrepreneurship at the Beijing Declaration and the Platform for Action conference organized uh, in partnership with the World Women Organization. Um, it is uh, a great honor and privilege to be part of um, such an amazing array of speakers, uh, but also to engage with a very engaged audience who is obviously very interested in this very important topic of how we achieve the SDGs, how do we collaborate for action, and what are practical ways in which our works can actually um, create that future we want. My name is Darshita Gillis. I am founder and CEO of a tech company called Munch. We are registered in London, UK. Um, I am originally from India, from Mumbai. And uh, before I sort of talk about what we can do, I want to share um, a short story, the story of my beginnings. And also I want to share with you my some aspects of my journey in a very short time frame. Um, to maybe draw strands um, as to how we can learn from some practical experiences I've had on how we can enable women uh, globally to participate in ensuring we have an inclusive future. Um, I say my story is from the bottom 1% to the top 1% for 100% of the planet. And what I mean by that is um, I was born in a, in a very humble home. Uh, I come from a scheduled caste background. My parents don't speak English. Um, I am the eldest daughter with my brother and sister younger than me. We lived in a very small home uh, up until the age of 24. My brother, sister and I, we shared the same bed. Um, we had many practical challenges living in a big urban city with very little to no income uh, in surviving, not just in conducting lives, but just basic survival. And there were days where we didn't have food at home. Um, there were days I've studied by candlelight because we couldn't afford to pay our electric bills um, and so on and so forth. And the reason why I'm emphasizing some of my life instances is to just share with you that I do know what it's like um, uh, to live the life of a bottom 1% person and it's not easy and I have uh, since then studied to be an accountant, I've worked as a banker, uh, as a consultant, as an entrepreneur and I've found a way to thrive in, in, the, in the world and I have grown up to become a global citizen and what always puzzles me is um, in all these years, in the last 30 years, our economies have grown over a hundred times and yet we still have a global population that suffers the same challenge I did 30 years ago and that's not right and I feel that's um, something that we as a community, as a global community, if we put our attention to solving some of these challenges that seem to have existed on the planet for as long as humanity has existed, um, we do have uh, an opportunity to resolve them in this lifetime. And um, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals really lay out um, quite well in a unified way um, uh, some of the world's to-do list and that can galvanize all of us into meaningful and purposeful action to create the future we want. Um, and I want to pay specific attention to the role of women in enabling that future, in part because um, in my work at Munch, as well as um, in my previous roles as a consultant, looking at the UN statistics uh, from 162 countries on the progress on SDGs and how the SDGs are interrelated, the one thing that can be the most impactful thing that touches across all the SDGs is good investment in women and girls 
in their education and in their opportunities to have the right livelihood. And I think if we as a global community can solve that one challenge, the ripple effects of that can be um, can be seen and felt across to pretty much impact on all the 17 sustainable development goals. Um, maybe I'll share a little bit more of my entrepreneurial journey now, um, because I think the challenges for women and children are not just um, in the bottom 1%. Even in our Western world, women face many challenges in um, employment, in um, inequality with gender pay, um, there is biases for investing in women-led enterprises. Uh, when I started to raise funding for Munch um, two years ago, I knew that if I had my um, partner sitting at the table across with an investor, he would have won the funding round um, at least a year before I did. Um, and, and so it continues to be a challenge. We know from statistics that of one dollar that's invested um, every year, only one cent goes to women-led enterprises. And this is a systemic bias that is um, already built into the architecture of how investments occur. So these are some very practical challenges that that face women in Western civilization as well in being able to uh, really give effect to their dreams, vision, hope, and become inclusive members of the economic society. Um, and then to round it up, uh, I want to leave us with um, some inspiration, but also I want to leave us with some practical action points. So those of you who are here and listening to this um, video recording, um, if you are a business and or a business owner or part of a business um, or an entity, uh, the one thing you can do is look at how women in your business or in your offices are paid. If there exists gender bias pay, please take it up at the management level. If you are at the management level, do something about it. Um, I did the same as well here at Munch. Um, when I hire someone, I always review the pay of everyone else in the team to ensure that there are no systemic biases that are building up in an organization, especially if you are part of startups, um, that you have an opportunity to set the record straight from the word go. Uh, the other things business owners and people in business in general can do is to ensure that all your business processes have gender sensitivity. What I mean by that is start to take a look at um, your procurement policies, maybe include a clause to give a preference to a women led business. Um, um, you could also add um, um, policies to ensure that uh, work, working women uh, with children have some flexible arrangements that enable them to continue being employed. Uh, we know from COVID that the job losses um, and especially those impacting women have been quite high. Um, that's from a business point of view. Uh, if you are also engaged in philanthropy and giving matters, um, I think a specific focus on women-led um, or women-focused empowerment initiatives that really create long-term systemic structures uh, or trainings or awareness uh, creation and tools for women to start getting gainfully uh, engaged in the economy uh, is one way in which you can direct your philanthropy. So try and invest in long-term solutions that actually build on-ground support services to enable longer-term uh, regenerative capacity of communities to engage their women and children. Um, finally, I think all of us are uh, citizens of the world and as um, as we all uh, do and be, we, we all have a duty of, um, uh, of support towards each other, um, as well as I feel that um, 
the global community is now getting even more and more smaller in, in terms of our connectivity. Uh, if you consider, um, I'm sitting here in London uh, and you're probably sitting there in China or in Japan or in the United States, connectivity is so much, um, uh, has enabled so much. Uh, the key question for us as global citizens is what can we do as individuals to uh, foster uh, the role of women um, in everyday civil engagement. Uh, I think of small things, uh, for example, a, co a conference like this, and if you know of other conferences, try and bring members or women who are good speakers, who deserve a platform to share their voice to a wider audience, just invite them. Um, I'm pretty sure that uh, if you have an amazing platform that can give voice to inspiring women, women are ready to take the stage and, and really embrace and enable uh, a much more inclusive and diverse future. Um, I'm going to sh end here. Um, it's been fantastic. Thank you for engaging with me uh, in the last 10 minutes. If you have any questions, um, I am available uh, on my email, darshita at munch.com, M-A-A-N-C-H, munch.com. Um, and uh, also I'm available on LinkedIn. So please feel free to reach out, ask questions and, and learn more about the work we do at Munch. Uh, in creating technologies to really capture impact. Um, and also, if there is anything that we as an organization or me in my personal capacity, I can do to help you and, and your growth, um, I would be very happy to learn how. Thank you. So we move on to our program. Thanks everybody for staying on with us. Uh, the next speaker is Ms. Erin Tian, who is the general manager of Forbes China Business Operation. Ms. Tian has worked in the media industry for many years and always committed to use uh, media to build cultural exchanges. The work involved includes cross-culture communication, content planning, writing and compiling, program production, event planning, and organizing forum hosting. Uh, in addition, there are also brand management, media relations, government relations, et cetera, et cetera. Ms. Tian has interviewed more than 100 domestic and foreign celebrities, planned and organized more than 300 financial summits, lifestyle dinners, art education sharing session, and classical concerts. I'm sure you wanted to meet Ms. Tian yourself now, so Ms. Tian, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Irene Holing Tian. It's my honor to be here to share with you my thoughts and experience on the topic of women and the media as a representative from media and communication industry. My involvement in the media began as a student when I was involved in organizing team publications, and I have since worked in media industry for 20 years. I'm not alone in my family in taking an interest in media. My parents are also media related practitioners, which has given me exposure to media since childhood. And in the past few years, I have organized more than 300 forums, including things about economy, investment, environment, technology, innovation, urban planning. Among these events, I have invited more than 1,000 guest speakers and panelists around the world and have interviewed many of them. However, the proportion of women among them is particularly low. The World Media Trends Report published by UNESCO in 2018 indicated that print and digital media in most countries do not provide a balanced picture of women's diverse lives and contributions to society in a changing world. Truly, there are so many wonderful, talented, diligent women in the world that need to be discovered, reported, and disseminated by media. I have worked at Forbes for nearly 10 years. Fortunately, I have worked my way up from being a manager to the position I now occupy, and I'm proud to be one of the youngest female leaders of Forbes Group. However, I found that more women are involved in careers in the communication sector, but few has attained positions as a decision-making level 
also on governing boards or bodies that influence media policy. The World Media Trends Report published by UNESCO in 2018 highlights that only one in three reporters and only one in four media decision makers are women. In addition, with the popularity of some eye-catching digital media, along with violent and degrading pornographic media products, the perception of women in society has been negatively affected. Every time I read this information, I couldn't help but wonder what role the media has given to women. How to make more women feel confident? How can more women be given the opportunities they deserve? I believe that the media has the responsibility to guide women to build the spirit of self-respect, self-confidence, self-reliance, and self-improvement and have the power to create a social environment conductive to women's full development and to promote women's independence, innovation, and spiritual wisdom. This month, the World Women Organization gathered leaders from all over the world at the 25th anniversary celebration of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action to discuss the important role of women in achieving the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, which addresses the crucial role women can play in the development of the future world. This topic has been on the agenda of the United Nations in recent years, which have placed emphasis on the importance of women and the media. And in recent years, Fox China has tried to respond to women with a developmental perspective. It reflects to a certain extent the women's encouragement and guidance for the development of women and provide a broad stage for women. We focus on discovering and unleashing the power of women at all levels, including in the fields of business and technology. These women may be company founders, company leaders, technology and industry innovators, or industry pioneers. Though regardless of their particular focus, they all have the same strong entrepreneur spirit, a profound technical or academic background as men. While at the same time, these women can use their unique patience and empower to bring a different an often innovative perspective to the working environment. We launched the first annual list to honor the top 50 women in tech in mainland China last year. They may be entrepreneurs, senior executives, frontline researchers, engineers, or innovation pioneers, holding at least one degree at a STEM related major and actively engaging in areas related to science and technology. This year, we put emphasis on women who have leveraged the power of science and technology to fight against COVID-19. For instance, Li Ying, corporate vice president of Baidu, led Baidu map team in preventing COVID-19, revealing data to the public regularly to deploy prevention and control. To search for successful female venture investors, we also launched the China's 25 best women venture capitalists, ranking VCs on the performance of their withdrawal projects and the development of the non withdrawn ones over the past five years. As of this year, Kathy Xu, founder and president of Capital Today, has a talent for investing in successful enterprises, including Jingdong, NetEase, Meituan Dianping, and so forth. Next is the list of China's top businesswomen. Considering factors including business scale, quality, number of employees, and external influence. All of the listings have stood out in a fierce business environment and tapped into all aspects of society. They have great personal influence and impressive career achievements and the companies managed by 100 listings add up to a total market capitalization of nearly 10 trillion yuan. 
We also pay attention to those business women with great potential. Last year, we launched a list of 20 rising female stars in business based on operation, growth potential, public influence, and development of their companies. This year, they also emerged in hardcore technology fields, such as artificial intelligence, robotics, industry, software, and healthcare. Besides, we selected some of the most prominent women to grace the cover of Forbes magazine as female business models, such as Jane Sun from Ctrip, Yan Zhao from Blumatch Biotech, Dong Mingzhu from Gree Electronic Appliance, Hu Weiwei from Mobike, and so on. As a financial and business media, Forbes has honored quite a few business women who are as distinguished as men. These Mulans in business, with their unique charm and excellent leadership, stand out in a highly competitive market and win a place of their own. And we will continue to explore and report. Here, I would like to call on more media to promote and command excellent female models in various fields and cultivate and recommend female talents. At last, Thanks to the organizer, World Women Organization, and Honorable Angela RM for inviting me to take part in this significant event and celebration. And also thanks for all the participants for your efforts and attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irene. Um, I'd like your angle to describe how media can help promote women of their much deserved place in the society in any uh, function that really hold up uh, the economy, the business and the politics. Hopefully that you will find inspiration from today's speech and nominate the World Women Organization uh, people to the next Fox uh, cover. So thank you very much. Thank you. Great. So our next speaker is Stefan Markshield. Uh, he is the CFO for Childwise International. Mr. Markshield is chairman, uh, um, is, uh, uh, sorry, again, the CFO. Um, and uh, Childwise is an early childhood education uh, entity that provides CDA qualification training uh, to teachers and uh, educators for children age zero to six. Um, I will now enable Mr. Mark Scheidt to share your screen. So I'm going to talk about uh, uh, gender diversity in uh, corporate boards. Uh, as uh, Jusha mentioned, I'm uh, uh, associated with Childwise. I'm also an independent director on the boards of four public companies. Uh, all of them are Chinese companies listed in Hong Kong and uh, New York. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, many of our speakers have spoken about uh, aspects of gender diversity, whether it's government, healthcare, education, society. Uh, I'm a businessman. I'm going to talk about business. Uh, uh, I guess Priscilla, Dr. Liu, Priscilla Liu also talked about women uh, in companies. And women in companies uh, have many roles either as customers, as shareholders, as corporate executives. Uh, but uh, for this uh, talk, I'm going to talk about women as board members. Uh, next slide, please. So companies uh, benefit greatly from uh, gender diversity. And, uh, you know, particularly, you know, uh, uh, against uh, their commercial prospects, whether as uh, having a larger talent pool to draw on for staff, uh, a better perspective. Uh, women bring a lot in terms of collaboration, uh, retaining staff, uh, reflecting how customers think, uh, recruitment. Uh, and this leads to greater profitability, as McKinsey has uh, analyzed that companies with greater gender diversity enjoy 21% greater profitability. Uh, in addition, we find that uh, uh, women on boards uh, lead to better innovation and uh, better decision making. So how are we doing? Okay, board diversity, um, you know, it's increased over time. You look at the, you know, the Russell uh, 3000 index on the upper right, 
uh, from 11% in 2008, we're up to close to 20% of uh, women representation on corporate boards uh, in 2018. But there's a lot of uh, variation from country to country. You know, on, on the left side, you can see that Norway is quite prominent with 42% of board directors are women. Uh, US uh, is coming up with 16%, uh, whereas Italy is uh, a bit lower at 6%. Uh, on, on the lower right, you can see that there are only five countries uh, that have a majority of companies with no women on the company boards. You know, the Middle East is well represented there as well as uh, South Korea. Uh, but uh, almost all countries have some women on boards and that's increasing over time. So what are, what are the challenges here? Uh, the challenges are that uh, boards generally don't prioritize diversity in their recruiting efforts. Uh, boards look for people like them, and that tends to be uh, men, right? Uh, the traditional candidate pipelines are, are fairly limited uh, because directors, when they're looking for new board members, tend to rely on their personal networks. Uh, and in addition, you know, there isn't that great turnover in boards. You know, uh, the board members typically have a three-year term, so there aren't that many openings at any one time. So, you know, the figure at the right, the, the, the graphic really shows that what male board members like me say is that we don't have enough qualified female candidates, whereas women who are board candidates say that gender diversity really isn't a priority. Uh, next slide. So where, where are we really going from here? Uh, what, what boards like mine need to do is prioritize diversity. And you know, one of the ways we can do that is by setting targets for the number of women or proportion of women on the boards, uh, requiring that we have diversity in our slate of candidates. Uh, mentoring. Mentoring is, is crucial, and I think that's come up from a, a number of our speakers, that uh, people like me need to work with women to prepare them to be ready for uh, board assignments. Uh, expanding the pipeline, uh, going beyond your traditional candidates and looking for women that we've heard from a lot in this session who are qualified, and, and you have to look for them. Um, Accelerating turnover, you know, limiting uh, the, the board tenure, uh, and then evaluating board performance. So we have uh, recommendations on the right. Uh, and, and the graphic below shows that, uh, you know, we're on track right now to hit 30% or more women on corporate boards by 2027, 50% by 2024. That's like 24 years from now. It's way too long. Uh, I hope and expect that uh, through this session and uh, everybody's participation, we can uh, do that quicker and uh, we can uh, improve uh, corporate accountability uh, through gender diversity. Thank you. Great, wonderful speech. Thank you so much, Steve. That's again, very interesting angle to discuss the gender diversity uh, on, on the corporate board. Uh, I agree with you, 24 years is way too long. Let's try to hit that goal earlier with the help of organization like World Woman Organization. Exactly. Thank you. So we will move on and the next speaker, uh, I'll just do a quick uh, looking around. I think Mr. Allen uh, from the Sprout Foundation is here. So as he enable his uh, uh, screen, I will give all of the uh, attendees his brief bio. Mr. Alan Wan, he's a founder and chairman of the Sprout Foundation. The foundation focuses on developing ESG-focused technologies and social ventures in Asia. Mr. Wan holds a bachelor's degree of science and a master's degree of science in electrical and computer engineering from Carnegie Mellon University. As a skilled entrepreneur, Mr. Wan has led various venture capital investments in the US, UK, Hong Kong, China, and Myanmar regions. Mr. Wan has also invested in various education platforms in Asia and gained insights into the sector through in-depth operation experiences. His vision is to develop high quality education institutions and further empower <laughs> underprivileged children in Asia. Well, welcome Mr. Wan and the floor is yours. 
Hi everyone. Good morning. Uh, well, it's just some good evening. My name is Alan, and I'm very privileged to be able to speak on this platform. And I was told to do some sharing on our site, and uh, perhaps can provide some inspirations. Um, I am not a um, in political career, so I cannot really much uh, speak on the uh, political front. I've been always been staying in the private sector, so and I would uh, speak from that angle. And before that, I would like to share a uh, story, and it's a very personal story, and a story about a little boy who was born in the early 80s in China, uh, in a village uh, uh, environment, and where the grandfather was a peasant, and the father just came back from the uh, Cultural Revolution, and being put at a job in the government. Everyone is very happy, and when the boy arrived, the, uh, the entire family is elated that it was a boy, and when the boy arrived, um, and obviously it's the oldest of the family, so the pride of having a boy was uh, insurmountable, even around the village. The boy was given a lot of privilege, and in terms of education, in terms of the hierarchy of family, in terms of opportunities. And when China opens up, the family moved to Hong Kong, and then Australia, and then um, United States. It was given a very top education, and was given an opportunity to work abroad. And then the boy actually uh, got married. And throughout the journey, um, the gender awareness was not one of his uh, topic at all, not uh, by first. The boy actually was put into the single sex school, a boy school. So there was not, the gender equality topic was never mentioned. And then the boy was put into a, uh, well, he interviewed for a job in a Wall Street firm where testosterone uh, atmosphere was the uh, primary um, uh, theme in the trading floor. And until he met his wife, and let me say that, love conquers all. And having been to the labor room, the boy actually growing into a man and having new, uh, massive respect for uh, women in general. And in the labor room, the wife said, I want a girl. And the boy, being a man now, simply accept the fact that it is a blessing to have uh, love in general and gender is actually secondary. Now, I want to point this out um, because it's very personal, um, but it actually reflect various point uh, fault in our education system and in the society. I think our effort right now is to go into education um, industry in hopes to talk about these issues about, of uh, gender equality and to bring awareness to students and families and parents, all the stakeholders in society that gender equality is a must, is awareness that we need to talk about. And like any other um, speaker that before me, um, gender sensitivity in hiring in a hierarchy is very important. So in a few years ago, we started a mission called Sprout and it's a nonprofit organization uh, focusing um, mostly in education and ESG technology companies. We started by sponsoring a school in Hong Kong, a secondary and primary school. When we actually started and doing that, we our agenda really was to try to promote product quality education. So, and then when we actually look into it, we realize most of the ailment in the society was partially, maybe indirectly caused by um, the schooling system, right from the uh, agenda of pursuing academic excellence, giving grades to students, which a lot of the region in the world already are abandoning that system. But in this part of the world, we're actually still embracing it. So in terms of uh, gender equality in our schools, we made sure that uh, the leadership role was balanced. So we have a male uh, principal and we also have a female principal. And in the hiring policy, we make sure that um, gender equality was uh, ensured. And in fact, women actually, uh, female gender actually perform way better in the education industry. And we now have a plan to uh, sponsor family from the underprivileged class to have education sponsored so that they can actually take a role in the education uh, industry. As uh, well, maybe not everyone knows about the education industries in Hong Kong, the teaching 
the teachers more well paid than uh, most of the industries. So by providing uh, the access from not able to provide education to and empowering them to become a teacher, we solve many problems at the same time. The second part of our uh, effort right now is to start ESG-focused technology companies. One of them in particular is focusing working with charities. So our technology basically will empower donors in a very passive way to pass their um, donation into various charity of the choice. And inspired by the previous speaker, um, we would definitely put in the design that uh, not only 1%, maybe up to 50% of the uh, donation will be geared towards a female-oriented charity. I, we think that um, such mission will continue and it, would, it is a very long uh, journey and we're only scratching the surface of it. And uh, I think that um, our mission is actually a multitude of uh, aspects and uh, gender equality is, uh, now that I'm involved in this, uh, 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 this mission, I think that is, um, it will become one of our core value that to promote forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Wan. And I hope I'm, we share your goal to have 50% of the funds that goes to women-led uh, entities and initiatives. And uh, we we're very touched by the little boy's story. So thank you for sharing a very personal detail with us tonight and this morning. Uh, so our next speaker, actually you might have heard her name before and it may sound very familiar. Uh, Virginia Tan, who was mentioned earlier, and congratulations, Virginia, on winning that uh, award at the, uh, at the last gala that Anla mentioned. Uh, a little bit of background about Virginia. Um, she is a founder, founding partner of Teja Ventures. Uh, this is Asia's first gender lens venture capital fund, which targets early stage technology companies relating to the Xi economy. Ms. Tan is the co-founder of She Loves Tech. It's the world's largest startup competition for women in technology and the Wonder School, it, which is a leadership academy for women professionals and entrepreneurs, together with Jen Sun, the CEO of Seatrip, and one of Forbes' 100 most powerful women in the world. Virginia is also the co-founder and president of Lean in China, one of China's leading nonprofit platform for women with over 100,000 members across more than 25 cities and 100 universities in China, which support the goal to inspire, inspire Chinese women. So thank you so much for being with us here today, Virginia, and uh, I will play your slides now. Hi, um, thank you very much for having me. Um, I, I am absolutely delighted uh, to be here. Um, I think to to reflect and, and to celebrate, um, you know, the 25th anniversary, uh, you know, of the Beijing Declaration. Um, and it's also, by the way, 100 years since women uh, formally got the right to vote. Um, next slide, please. So, Today, what I really wanted to focus on was actually to talk about capital, entrepreneurship, and technology. I think, um, you know, a lot of the, the, the sort of discourse, you know, I think as, as we've gone to many, many women's conferences, um, and rightly so, you know, have been on, you know, the rights of women being pushed back across the world, you know, a lot of the suffering that has been unleashed by COVID. But I really do believe that until we actually talked about capital, leveraging and unlocking capital, to serve women's uh, needs at scale, um, we're actually never going to be able to, 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 to serve those needs. Those needs will always go unserved um, or we will always continue to just get the leftovers of, of, of funding. So I want to talk a little bit more about the investment case, you know, for women, uh, for investing in women, but not just women at the top, uh, not just women, you know, who is a CEO, who is a, who is a founder or who is who's on the board. I want to talk about investing in women as a demographic, as consumers, uh, as online traffic, as mobile workforce, as supply chain. So this is why I, 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 I essentially built Teja. So on the 25th anniversary of, um, uh, of the Beijing Women's Convention, you know, I, I do believe that the most pressing need we face is to 
unlock capital to serve the needs of women at scale. If women are always just seen as social beneficiaries of rights and not the market makers and economic drivers that they actually are, or as long as that perception remains, that prevents meaningful capital from actually coming into the space. As said before, we simply get the leftovers of funding as an afterthought. And by the way, not just from men, but also from women themselves, as well as institutions. Next slide, please. This is actually the reason why I built Tejaventures. Ventures. Every time I used to walk into the room and, um, if, I mean, I came from a commercial background, um, you know, doing emerging market investments for almost a decade, um, working on the Belt and Road. And then I, I, I started building nonprofits for women and, and we managed to build one of China's largest nonprofits for women. <clears throat> and I spent seven years of my life understanding, you know, how technology was changing, you know, women's consumer needs, what they, what they wanted, what they were buying, you know, what they were dreaming of. But every time when, when I started to, you know, to build Teja, every time I walked into the room, I think the, the elephant in the room was the fact that people always saw gender as a limitation rather than as an opportunity. They would ask me, Virginia, why do you choose to, um, you know, focus just on 50% of the population? Aren't you limiting yourself? And I said, women as consumers do not represent 50% of spending. They actually represent 80% of global discretionary spending. They are uh, multiple markets in one. They buy on themselves on behalf of their households. And I've seen this in practice. So what essentially happened is in, in all those years of building nonprofit communities, um, one of the things that we, we, we did is that we incubated a startup competition called She Loves Tech. That was one room in Beijing in 2015 for about 100 people, 10 entrepreneurs. In 2020, we are in 30 countries across the world in six continents with the largest startup competition for women in technology in the world. And what I've had the benefit and privilege of seeing essentially is two to 3,000 you know, investment deals a year just from the competition alone and to see how women are actually representing a new generation of innovation. And actually, you know, at the forefront of this innovation is solving some of the world's most pressing needs. And that is one of the reasons why I started to invest as an angel investor, starting to put my own money before I even thought about building a fund. And then when large funds such as, you know, Sequoia Capital, Tim Draper, you know, Amazon started to put money into some of our winners, I started to realize that actually there was an untapped commercial opportunity here, what I call the she economy that people were actually missing. And what was really missing was capital at scale to actually leverage upon these opportunities. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So, you know, to empower women um, as market makers, you know, we need to use what I call the modern instruments of our time, new forms of capital, data, and technology. And capital, which I believe needs to be allocated to what, what the Harvard Business Review has termed the she economy or the largest economy in the world. And what I believe is the biggest arbitrage opportunity of our generation. This is what the data tells us. The she economy worldwide is, is worth 18 trillion and in Asia worth 8 trillion. If you look at it, women as a demographic on one side, as consumers, as online traffic, and as a mobile workforce, and the explosion of the internet economy on the other side. I mean, I choose to focus on Southeast Asia uh, because, you know, that's where we're actually, you know, concentrating our, our investments with some strategic exposure to China and India. Um, and actually COVID-19 is actually accelerating, um, you know, this opportunity. So women control spending. More women buy online than, than men. They're more active than men online um, in terms of social networks. And as the future of retail changes, this is an opportunity. As, as COVID has shown us, you know, as we move towards a world, to, you, know, in, you know, with contingent and remote work, that also stands to actually provide more economic opportunities for women, which have traditionally been more time poor and also having to balance the needs of, of work and family. So the rise of the internet economy, you know, essentially is actually providing, you know, on, 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 a, on, a, on a, on a mass scale opportunities for women when previously that world actually wasn't necessarily, you know, grouped or, or, or structured around, around the lives of women. And, and this language of opportunity, you know, is what capital, men and women and institutions understand and we need to use this language to actually include them in what I call the women's movement. They use the language of capital and the, the language of opportunity to congregate some of the most powerful capital allocators around the table. And one of the encouraging things is that in recent times I've seen some of these attitudes change. 
when the argument is phrased in terms of what I call the Xi economy, in terms of economic opportunity. So we need to change the narrative, I believe, around women's rights um, and, 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 and women's discourse. Next slide, please. On the 25th anniversary of the 1995 convention, what I do feel optimistic about is the data shows us that women are both the biggest drivers as well as beneficiaries of new business models in the internet economy. The, the, what, what we see driving the rise of the internet economy amongst other factors, you know, are, for example, you know, uh, things like content, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a digital economy, content is king, new retail models, the increasing digitalization of services and also payments. You know, uh, women actually constitute more than 70% of actually services, um, uh, service workers around the world. Um, and, and, and also also most locked out of financial inclusion. So the digitalization of services and payments can unlock um, opportunities in terms of time and labor, um, as well as, 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 as ex access to banking in the first place. And what I, what, what, what I term the Xi economy is actually at the center of that. What we are realizing and what, we're, what, what the data is showing us is that women as a demographic, whether they're consumers, online traffic or mobile workforce, are driving the growth of companies, regardless of whether they are female oriented or not particularly in the internet, mobile, and social media uh, businesses. Next slide, please. As, as an investor, you know, we are seeing this in key industries such as, for example, the future of retail, health and wellness, education, financial inclusion, um, you know, the content economy, et cetera. These are all bets actually that we had placed, um, you know, before COVID-19, but actually essentially what COVID-19 has done is is actually accelerate that. And these verticals all stand to benefit. And, and I believe that women also all stand to benefit from the development of these verticals. Next slide, please. In a post-COVID world, we women are conduits to new markets and new patterns of consumption behavior. And the opportunity posed by technology, right, is, is, is this, to unlock access and economic opportunities for women. And this is what I think digitalization and a digital world, you know, allows us to do. It removes some of these existing systemic barriers of bias, of cost, of access, of physical limitations, of time. And in a post-COVID world, what I believe is what I've seen is a growing openness to doing things differently, you know, given that the gaps, you know, ex exposed in our existing systems. And the key to leverage capital into technology and business models, which empower women as a de demographic, is actually to look at women as a whole, right? And, and at Tasia Ventures, you know, when we source and we invest and we look for deals, you know, I think one of our underlying, you know, sort of criteria is, you know, how do we put more income, more economic opportunities and better consumer options, you know, in business models, um, you know, in, 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 when looking at business models, which we believe are commercially scalable. And the question that I pose is actually, once you, you put things like more income, more economic opportunities and better consumer, consumer options for women, how does that change consumer behavior for all of us as a society? And what would women actually do with that additional income and those additional economic opportunities? And finally, I think what the data is also showing us is that when you invest in women as market makers, when you invest in the Xi economy, women also become conduits for social change. And that social change is amplified by technology. Women have become the medium to social change. The SDGs do not stand independently of SDG 5. SDG 5 is a conduit you know, to, 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 to many, many other of the SDGs. And we're seeing that actually across our investing. What we need to do is to build and showcase clearly this investment case so that we can congregate real capital around women's rights and needs. But that language needs to change. And, 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 and as we've seen, when you invest in gender equality, um, you, know, you invest essentially in you know, increased nutritional, educational, um, um, and, and other outcomes for families. You're raising societal incomes per capita in the long run, and they are further conduits to achieving the other SDGs. And, 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 and I think to the women on the call today, this is, this is what I pose to you. You know, the greatest inter, intergenerational transfer of wealth is occurring, you know, to women you know, at this very moment. But it remains to be seen if we will spend this wealth differently and to truly empower each other. And until we actually use the capital in our hands wisely, we will be unable to fully mold the world in our vision. As a venture capitalist, my fight and my mission is to be that bridge, you know, between capital, technology, and women, and to build a business case to, un to, to unlock more capital to flow into the space. And to the men on the call, you know, um, to unlock capital to serve the needs of women and girls at scale, the fight must include men. As a fund, we also invest in male entrepreneurs who are building systems and products which benefit women positively. We are around 60% female entrepreneurs and 40% male entrepreneurs because I believe innovation is gender blind. 
And we also increasingly have male investors coming into the fund who recognize the opportunity of the Xi economy and understand that this is actually a conduit to not just new markets, but also the social change that we need to see as a whole, especially in a post-COVID world. Thank you very much for your time. And I look forward to connecting with the rest of you. Thank you very much, Virginia. Um, we, we share your same wish and blessing for more capitals to uh, the Xi economy. Uh, and I think it's a it's pro opportune time for us to re revisit all of the concept uh, and to really invigorate the Xi economy. So thank you very much. So up to our next speaker, let me introduce the next gentleman, Azi Sahin. He's the president of Atik. Uh, Atik is a trade and corporation council, which was founded in 2005. President Sahin, he, he started his work in EU countries, mostly in Germany and Brussels. In 13 years, Atin, Atik organization has grown bigger, and by the year 2018, President Sahin did very tight cooperation with 48 countries and in 100, 147 cities all over the world. Hello, I am greeting from Germany. It's lovely to hear from you and to hear that you are safe and well. Congratulations as well on your new role. I would be happy to share this with the UNC members. Atik International Trade and Cooperation Council has 58 uh, countries uh, in the world and 174 Atik presidencies within the countries. Atik is involved in educational, cultural, social and economical studies. The WWO is currently registered with the United Nations Departments of Economic and Social Affairs. The WWO recognizes and, and we could for the United Nations global efforts to achieve peace, dignity, and equality on a healthy planet. He is and he is as a reflection, reflection of the COVID-19 epidemic under his influence the whole world. Fear and panic chosen by the epidemic deeply affect market mechanism causing supply and demand shocks. Including other countries are take hours of economic policy measures as well as with monetary expansions within their own country. The common point of the production is that 2020 will pass with the problem of negative growth and increasing unemployment all over the world. It is upset that these regulations Practice in which the complication in the economic sense is circumvented for the second time has also increased. Anything else you need in the meantime, please don't hesitate. All the best to you and your team. My name is Aziz Shahin. I am president of at the International Trade and Cooperation Council. Well, we thank all of the speakers who can't be with us because of the time zone difference, but, but still managed to sending their greetings through uh, and through the videos. 
Um, so we thank you all for participating at this very critical event. Our next speaker is uh, Mr. Yu Fu Cheng. Dr. Yu Fu Cheng, good evening or good morning. Uh, Dr. Cheng is the China Director for G20 Region for Climate Action. He's the Chinese Director to Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation. So Dr. Chen partners with governments, public authorities, and companies to identify and implement regional climate protection projects. Dr. Chen serves as the Chief Strategic Officer at UTIL, it's a R20 partner, a platform which provides a total solution for green energy and energy efficiency projects. He also participated in setting low carbon fuel standard Energy and Climate Registry, U.S.-China Clean Tech Transfer, Green Car Rating, when he served as a Senior Vice President at the Innovation Center for Energy and Transportation. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chen, for spending time with us, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for your great uh, introduction, and uh, thanks for the invitation, Angela. Uh, and uh, I want to just step a little bit away for you guys to see the fire uh, in uh, uh, just uh, I took the photo on my street uh, so you can see that uh, there's a fire still going on uh, so not only we are locked at home but we, we also need to lock the windows because the air was so bad outside um, so I so that's I was shared with Anna uh, Anna Chen uh, who just mentioned that if we have the women president we probably were not in this situation. So I think uh, uh, right now so a lot of people will, uh, will, will feel very pitiful that uh, we did not do a very good job in the last uh, election. So, so right now, so we are we're in a very bad situation to lock the inside, but uh, thank you for the great technology enable us to connect with you all as this wonderful event. Um, so, uh, uh, I, I want to make a little bit of a correction. Actually, it is uh, our organization is not a G20, it's R20. R stands for regions of climate, regions, regional government. Um, so actually this organization is funded by Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger when he was governor uh, in California. So at that time, uh, I think uh, uh, we, we discussed about the climate change events. Uh, I think all of us know about uh, uh, the Copenhagen Climate Change Summit. At that time, uh, the, the, uh, the national government cannot reach an agreement. Uh, so uh, at that time, Governor Schwarzenegger said that uh, no matter uh, the national government reach agreement or not, it's up to the sub-national leaders to take the action on climate change issues. That, uh, that, that is the, at the time we organized our uh, organization. So the R20 generally work on this in three ways. It's one is uh, regions in action. Uh, the second one is technology in action. The third one is uh, uh, finance in action. So ba basically we are working with the regional government uh, to get the needs and to help them to develop uh, the economy uh, for the, at the regional level. And then work with the partners like the technology and the financial partner bringing the project on the ground to take action on climate change. That's why we call regions of climate action. So, uh, so today, so I would like to talk about uh, at, at the Great uh, uh, World Women's Organization event. So I would uh, uh, appreciate uh, that all of the women leaders that uh, who I worked in the past uh, have done so much great job um, in, in this environment. So a lot of people are, are debating about the men and the women who are important who are not important who are less important or, or what's the role it should be. Uh, so my, my, my debate always said, no matter how, how successful as a man you would be, but uh, you were born by your mom, you were born by a woman. So that's all, you need to always respect the woman, you need to always respect the, the contribution from the, from the woman. Uh, in my family, uh, I have six members in my family. I have uh, two daughters, and uh, my mom is live with me, my, my wife, and I have one son. So I have a two to one ratio of women to, to, uh, to, to men at home. So I always uh, respect the uh, women and, uh, and, uh, the, uh, and uh, the care and uh, uh, that I received all the time. So I think that uh, uh, generally, I, 
uh, I would say in the STEM, STEM field, uh, st science and technology uh, in the field is dominated by men, but it does not mean it is, I, I don't think this, uh, uh, it's maybe the role of the, uh, the, the difference between men and women. So I, I, in the environmental world, uh, a lot of people also said men uh, destroyed the, the planet and the woman is saving it. So the reason is because of the, uh, the, the men study that uh, doing a lot of uh, research and development and the women is care about the future, care about the family. That's, that's why there's so many women leaders in the environmental uh, area. Uh, so I, uh, for me, I studied the climate change for both my master's degree in China and a PhD in, uh, in USA. So uh, most of my classmates actually are females. Um, so I really think that uh, the female definitely care about uh, the environment. And, uh, and I also give an example for my daughter also, uh, because she, she also always watch what I'm doing on climate change issue and sustainability issues. As a, uh, as a high school student, she uh, wrote a, a, created a petition to the White House uh, and urged the President Donald Trump not to roll back on environmental policy and, uh, and also to, to take action on climate change. And, uh, and that's, uh, all, uh, that petition gets uh, a lot of um, uh, noticed by, by so many um, people uh, around, around, around the world. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, so she also takes care of a lot of sustainability issues. And, uh, and uh, then she, she, she just get admitted to, the, to the Columbia to study more on the social justice and, uh, and also environmental issue on sustainabilities. So today I would like to, uh, to talk a little bit more about the women and uh, the environment uh, and, uh, and the sustainabilities. Uh, as I mentioned to you, I work with so many great women leaders in this field. Like uh, I think uh, uh, most of people, most of you, uh, you probably know Jane Goodall uh, and uh, the California EPA Secretary Linda Adams, who created the a uh, AB32 or Global Climate Change Action Plan, and uh, and also that I also launched the lawsuit with the U.S. EPA at the time, it stated that greenhouse gas is a polluted gas or CO2 is a pollution. Uh, and, and also I work with Mary Nichols, the California Air Resource Board Chairman, uh, and uh, Lisa Jackson, uh, the, Calif uh, the US EPA uh, Secretary, Gina McCarthy also, uh, who is the US uh, yeah, EPA Secretary is working on the climate change, climate change issues in, uh, in Paris Climate Change Summit. Uh, I, I think we also mentioned the BYD Stella Lee, um, uh, as well, she's a uh, woman leader on, on the technology. And also Michel Saban from, from Paris, which is also our R20 uh, president. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and also I, I met uh, uh, Madam Al Albright at the Clinton Global Initiative, and uh, Mary Robinson, Robinson uh, who, used, who was the president of the Ireland, who participated in our events uh, to a greater degree. Uh, so I think that there are so many women leaders work, working these issues. Uh, so, so for the for the sustainability, we all, always think, uh, what is the sustainability? I think the first first of sustainability, we have to think about the future. We cannot talk about uh, sustainability. Unfortunately, uh, the current administration is not thinking too far ahead. So the women uh, help to reach reach the club. Global Climate Change Summit. And as another women leaders, we have to mention, uh, it is uh, um, Christina, Christina Figueres, who, who was the Secretary General of UNFCCC uh, during Paris Climate Change Summit, and who spent the tirelessly to reach the agreement. But when the, the Donald Trump became the president, we, we threw that into the trash. So what's the pity on that? So I think, uh, uh, in order to meet the sustainability, I think we have to define what, he, what is a sustainable, what's the, the sustainability. I think that there's, uh, to my understanding, I think that there's, the sustainability is, uh, has to think about the future needs for our future generation. We need, uh, we need to meet the needs of the present, the present uh, current uh, generation, but we will not compromise in the future. So uh, the women, uh, you, you are the, I, I think you are the hero because we need to care not on, on ourselves. 
We need to care of our children, our grandchildren, our future. I think that's exactly uh, what, what the woman has done to balance the man's power in the, in the development. I did not see so many people, women, women leader in the nuclear weapons field. I did not see so many people, uh, women leaders in the, in the uh, develop any, any, any weapon programs. And also did not see so many women in develop the technology we will use uh, the, the energy so aggressively. So I think that we definitely need to, to balance to reach the equi equilibrium. So I, uh, as I mentioned to you, I respect the women leaders in this field too, uh, so much, and I, including some Chinese leaders like uh, uh, Mrs. Zhao, Mrs. Zhao, um, um, uh, Zhao Ziyan, who is uh, the environmental uh, science leader in, in, for China doing environmental education for the Chinese government for over 25 years and also uh, meet so many uh, uh, women leaders in, in the business as well. I think uh, I also meet uh, a lot of uh, women in the sea level, but there's different sea level. They're called chief sustainability officer. So if you, re if you look at uh, uh, the Fortune 500 company, chief sustainability officer of a Fortune 500 company, you, can, you will see a lot of uh, proportion of uh, women, uh, and including, the, including Lisa Jackson, who is also the environmental officer for Apple uh, after, after she stepped down as the US EPA secretary. So uh, women has done a lot, but I also want to, uh, women to do more because I think the, the, our, our crisis is so important. We, we, we cannot just uh, complain uh, without the solutions. So I, I would like, like to uh, working with uh, our women leaders to do more, uh, I, I will use uh, the four different verbs. Like uh, one, the first one is observe, the think, second one is think, the third one is perform, the last one is speak. So when I, uh, I will explain the, what's this for, for uh, verbs meaning. First of all, you need to observe the current uh, problems. You need, uh, you need uh, uh, read, uh, read and uh, to understand what's, uh, what, what's caused the problems. And then you, you have to understand the science base, base of the problems or the challenges. And then you think, you, you, you talk with, the, with the, the leaders in this field, you talk with the scientists, and then you think of this about the solution, the strategies, and how to implement. And after you observe and think, now it's the time to perform. <clears throat> in order to perform, we need to work not only with the women leaders, but also with the men leaders. So sometimes uh, people like said, uh, I, I only need to work on the people who have the environmental conscience or sustainability minded people. But uh, I also want to let you know, it's also in equal important to stop people by destroying things. For example, if you want to make a river clean, uh, you cannot only just clean the river, but you also need to prevent people from putting the, the pollution into the rivers. So we need to perform, perform thoroughly and perform effectively. And lastly, but it's not, not least, you have to speak. You have to let the people know what you are doing. You have to let the people know uh, what is right and, and uh, how can, people can, work, can we work together with a group of people, including the governmental people, including the, the industry people, and including the uh, social justice people including the NGOs, including uh, and, uh, international organizations. So we need, uh, we need to work with uh, uh, as many people as possible. So we need, uh, that's, that's, that's the only way we can make a great changes. I'm looking forward to working with you all. I'm uh, so honored to speak over here and I'm looking forward to meet you, all of you shortly, if not before. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chen, and my apologies for mispronounce R20 um, to be G20. Um, I think not only you have the greatest fortune to meet some of the female superstars in environmental and um, uh, conservation area, but you are raising a superstar in your household. So thank you <laughs> thank so you. much thank for you. contributing to the world. Move on to the closing speaker, Mr. Thomas Gale. Let me briefly introduce Mr. Thomas Gale. 
Thomas Gill is the former core member of the President Bill Clinton's environmental legal advisory team. Mr. Gill has over 30 years of experiences in transnational affairs management. Currently, he serves as a partner and legal advisor in a large international law firm, has served as a core member of the Clinton Environmental Legal Advisory Team, uh, and he serves as the executive, chief executive officer, executive and general counsel at the uh, Fortune 500 companies. Um, so without further ado, I would like to yield the floor to Mr. Gill and uh, let him deliver the closing remarks for the second day of the 25th uh, anniversary. Good afternoon, good evening, and good night to the participants around the world. I'm very um, honored to be able to be a speaker and also to um, officiate the close of a really a wonderful um, and very successful meeting. Um, first, I want to thank the women's, um, the World Women Organization for assembling this uh, uh, august uh, group of uh, speakers. Also to the Malaysia Foreign Friends Alliance for their support and helping to coordinate this um, financially and logistically on it. Um, to the Malaysia Royal Family for their support um, and to the distinguished speakers and guests that have all attended here. As I say, it's a great honor for me to be here and to be with so many wonderful speakers and have the topics um, brought up that are so important on the, on the international issues of women's rights and women's uh, equality on it. Um, first, let me um, know that it is a lot of knowledge that I think we've received during these, this two-day session on it. Um, I think I wanted to review first the summit's purpose as stated in the original information. And the first was to review the Beijing delegation 25 years after it was uh, initiated. Um, I think from all the speakers and from our own reading and knowledge that um, we can agree that there's been tremendous progress on the um, initiatives that were brought forth 25 years ago. But I think we can also equally agree that we have a long ways to go. So we've accomplished a lot and I think that um, they can be very proud of all of that that has been uh, done, but that it's not time to slow down or to stop. It's really time to accelerate what we're doing to be able to accomplish more and more of these of these goals. Um, the second topic was covering the um, uh, convening the global leaders to talk candidly on gender equality. Um, and to accomplish this, um, we have really come to call it gender harmony. Um, and I believe that um, Dr. Washington captured much of it in, in her speech earlier uh, today in talking about the uh, gender um, alpha that are coming up and will be the most empowered um, women um, since the original maternal um, societies that uh, did a much better job on, on leading the world. Um, so I think that we can all agree that women have really done an amazing job in, in being able to do superior performance than their counterparts in, in many parts of the world. As many people have pointed out, uh, the COVID-19 um, epidemic has really um, demonstrated that the women-led societies on the whole have done much better than the, than the male-dominated um, uh, societies. So I think we can be very proud of that and to, and to see you know, how that was able to um, uh, demonstrate the, um, the ability of, um, of the women in that leadership roles. Um, we've talked a lot too about the uh, negative aspects of the, of the COVID, but I think too um, that there are some positive things associated with it. I think that the, the COVID forced us to take a much needed uh, pause and a cleansing breath um, for the earth, um, to see global pollution decrease at the highest rate that we've ever seen it. Um, to allow each of us to really evaluate, reevaluate our lives in many ways by forcing to slow down and stop and really see what's, what's going on in our, in our lives and be able to hit the reset button um, and redefine our gender roles to a great extent. Um, as many of the speakers pointed out that women have been disadvantaged by um, having to 
play a larger role in the in the home, the inability to be able to get into the workplace, which was um, set up particularly by a male dominated society. So, but I think that with this um, pause that we've had and the inability to congregate in the offices, it showed the great ability, cost savings and efficiencies on being able to work from home. And so I think that that is something that will carry forward for um, the next generation. Um, economically, businesses have seen that it makes much more sense to be able to do it this way. I think that individually, people have gotten to appreciate the extra time on the lack of need to, to commute. There's definitely a balance between um, having a unique space for our office and separated from our home life. Um, but I think that those are balances we can, we can each um, reach as we move forward. Um, the third area it was the um, planning uh, for the Asia Pacific Women's uh, Leadership Summit that will be later this year in Malaysia. So I think that that is good to um, uh, refocus on that and the social, economic, and global health uh, goals of that particular conference. Um, so I think this, this has helped to raise the awareness of, of that coming up later this year. And also preparing for the 2021 uh, Women's World um, com um, Conference on Development. So again, very important things to look forward to as we continue to uh, build the awareness of the, of the power of women in the society and their um, leadership roles uh, throughout the world. Uh, I believe we, um, for myself, I was very fortunate to be raised in a, in a maternalistically dominated uh, family. Uh, my best friend and, and greatest mentor was my maternal grandmother um, who helped to, uh, helped to raise me. Um, very strong mother, um, five sisters and a family of seven, um, three daughters who I'm very proud of. And each generation seems to um, get stronger in their availability to education and advancement in their, in their uh, work careers. Um, I think that everybody is aware that uh, in this day and age that women are actually the, the majority of people attending undergraduate uh, institutions. And I think that that will continue um, for the foreseeable future. Um, I was very fortunate to um, be born in what I believe was a gender blind uh, family. Um, so that everyone had the equal opportunity to move forward and try to accomplish their goals. Um, I like hearing the term gender harmony, which I think is a very nice way of expressing what our major, one of our major goals is to see the equality come out between the sexes. Um, I think too, we have some good guidance as we come along. I'm very proud of my oldest daughter who helped to do the um, guidance for the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals. Um, and so I think as, as several of the members have pointed out before, goal number five is specific to gender equality. Um, this is an excellent codification of how we can um, move our society um, forward in a focused way to empower women and girls and ensure their equal rights. Um, one thing though that the goal of, points out that I think is reprehensible in this day and age that it's still one in three women have experienced physical and or sexual violence. Um, that again is something that cannot be allowed to continue and something that again needs everyone to talk about in the Me Too generation um, to speak up if you are a victim and to find support from all the people around you. So I think we all have a role of, of losing this very negative aspect of it and focus on the, on the positive and, and lead things um, forward. Um, one of the main themes I've heard during the two days is that on a level playing field, women always do better. So I think that that is very important to remember every time the woman has outperformed their uh, male counterpart. Um, from national leadership control, as we talked about on the demonstrated by the, by the response to uh, COVID, um, to the entrepreneurial startups, to the wealth management, to the profitability and performance of companies that are led by women. So I think that this, again, is something that will um, generate the um, need to increase women in the, in the workplace and not force them just to start their own businesses to be able to um, be the leaders that they should be. Um, 
I had a uh, another article that I had read that I thought also did a very good job in summarizing um, a lot of the aspects that we can all look to try to um, encourage for women in the workplace. This was from Mala uh, Sharma, who is the VP and general manager of Creative Cloud Products at Adobe. Um, so she had a, a speech earlier this year, and she had uh, five major points that I'd like to I'd like to summarize here. So her feeling was number one: do what is right, not what feels good, so that you're out there every day trying to find the right way, the things that are the right way to do it. Um, sometimes that takes ignoring other people's opinions and what you think the expectations are, but in your heart, in your gut, you know what feels right and what doesn't. So act on those. Number two, tap into your superpowers. Everyone has them. Each one of you have very unique superpowers that you need to acknowledge and pull out. If you're an extrovert, learn how your voice can be heard and channel it in a positive way. If you're an introvert, Use that gift of deep reflection to be able to evaluate what you did right and where you can improve on things. Each one of us though, each one of you have that gift inside of you. So look inside, find it and bring it out because that is your contribution, unique contribution to society. Um, ask for feedback, then truly listen to it. I believe that that is something that is very important in that um, we really don't do enough. And I think in the workplace, in our home life, all around it, we need to, we need to ask, we need to listen, and then we have to act on it. We also need not to take it personally. That's something I think that many of us fail at, that we ask for feedback, and if it's negative, we see it as criticism instead of an attempt to be able to improve who we are and what we're doing. I also personally believe that we don't want to just ask, ask for feedback from our bosses. We want to do a 360 review. We want our peers to tell us what they think of what we do and how we can improve. We want to ask our subordinates how we're doing as a leader, how we can be a better leader, how we can do it. We want to ask our friends and family members what their honest opinions are. And again, not take it personally, but take it as a method of growth because we each need to grow in our own way to be able to accomplish our dreams and improve our society. Um, realize your impact and respect that. Every one of us is contributing in a special way. Each one of us has a different impact that sometimes we undervalue and don't see how we really are making a difference in people's lives and our company's lives in the future of our world. So, listen to that, uh, be um, um, reflective in what's going on, and then see how you can move things forward as well. Um, so you have to um, analyze it carefully and then move forward. And then if you, not, if you feel that you're not making a more a substantial enough impact, then check how you can make a more substantial impact. Again, it goes back to do what's right and tap into your superpowers. You have that. You have the ability to be able to create so much. So do that. Don't be afraid to do that. And if people are not valuing you for your um, impact, then you need to, you know, look other places and get to that, get to that better place in yourself. Um, the fifth and last one is be you. Don't try to be somewhere else. You find much more success in work and life if you look for the authentic self. So again, this is uh, self-respect uh, introspection that you need to do to be able to find those things that are the most important things to you. You will be more successful and happier if you find those things. You need to be able to reach inside and do that. Um, because each of you have something special to say and something special to give. You need, if you're not in the right platform to do that, get to the right platform. So again, I wanna thank everyone who's participated in this. It's been a great honor to be able to be here and, and share, the, share the time and ideas with you. Um, I know that this will continue on for another 25 years and I wish all the success um, to the Women's World um, Organization 
And with that, I'll turn it back over to Shah, who has been an incredible, incredible leader through this. And I'm sure I give a collective thanks for all your hard work and helping to mentor us through all of this, um, uh, the conference. So thank you again, Shah. Well, thank you, Thomas, so much. Um, I think you did, just did the mission possible as a superhero to conclude such two uh, very uh, rich content in two days as we all heard and summarize them into such a nice and organized speech. So we truly thank you for paying attention to every speaker and to inspire the hero in each of our hearts. So thank you very much. Uh, with that, I wanted to yell it back to Jing uh, who will uh, help us to conclude this uh, very memorable occasion of the 25th anniversary. So team, please. Thank you, yeah. Before I say the final words, uh, it's directly, uh, you know, our Director General Angela, would you start with some final words so we can officially adjourn the conference? Maybe, yeah, Director General Angela, say a few words first. Thank you. Excellency speakers, all dear friends, Thank you for your all wonderful speech. And I sincerely thank dear Thomas for his wonderful closing remark. I'm very grateful for the success of this event. I also thank for your all being with us to witness the 25th anniversary memory. Thank you. Thank you very much, yes. And for me as well, yeah, we have been working for a while, our entire team, even right now we have some of our team members are all here, have been working very hard on the leadership of our Director General Angela, in uh, Sha and Ching and uh, uh, Rose and, uh, uh, you know, um, I cannot name a few in the US side, plus we have a group of Felicity and also uh, in the China side, we have another team and in Malaysia, Malaysia, we have a great team member as well. So we all collaborative virtually during this time to put together such a wonderful conference. And Tom, Tom thank you for your great speech. That really well, very well summarized the entire content and the goals we discussed and the conclusions we re reach and also the next step forward for all of our, uh, you know, everyone at World Women Organization and also our supporters, friends, speakers and supporting organizations. And I would like to thank everyone. And I, I know I will miss some. Okay, Joe, Joe Yiping, Honorable Joe Yiping uh, in Shanghai and uh, Nancy Zhanghui in Beijing and the Phoenix TV who bring our uh, participant number to 500. 32,000 people through their live streaming of uh, our China special event. So um, it's hard to believe it's already done. You know, it's so much substantial content. We will organize them, edit them, put them into uh, videos and documents so we can share with a lot more people who are interested in attending, but due to technical concerns or difficulties, a lot of them couldn't really attend online or offline. So I think we will organize, edit the entire content for future view for a lot of the people who are interested in uh, learning our conference, learning about our conference and our women's development at the World Women, World Women Organization. So by saying that, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, I, 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 I think this content, you know, this conference, uh, and what we have done over the last two days will become part of history. And when we are celebrating a historical event happened 25 years ago, and today we made a milestone ourselves in history. And going forward, I know it's a long journey and we still have a lot to do. And we have a lot of challenges and obstacles for sure, but we also have hope and great team and we have passion and thanks for Tom's inspiring final five things for everyone to take inside. I think that's very inspiring. That's just exactly what we need to tap into our super, super, you know, superhero inside ourselves. Everyone does have that. And uh, to using that, move forward hand in hand 
together for gender harmony, for overall development of women, and for the sustainable development of humankind. With that, I would conclude today the conference. Wish everyone have a good night and wish, wish everybody in China have a good day. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Did we take a picture today? Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Yeah, Christiana, thank you very much for being with us all day. Thank you. I saw you being with us all. You want to? Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Do you want to take a picture? Anyone take a picture? Any? Any? We'll take a group photo. Let's take a group photo. Yeah. yeah. Zoe, uh, Zoe, Sunny, Xinran as our intern, and uh, Felicity. Yeah. Vince. Felicity, yes. Tony. Yes. Well, if you're, it's convenient for you, then <laughs> please show your, your lovely face. Yeah, yeah, please show your face. Everybody open your video. We're going to take a group picture. Okay, last call. Three. <laughs> Great. Wonderful. Thank you all for working late. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll, I'll do a counting down. Okay, everyone. Three, two, one. Smile. Great. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Oh, thank you very, thank you very much, everyone. Truly, truly appreciate. It. Thank you.